November 21st, uh, 2017 Planning Board meeting is called to order. First order of business is approval of minutes from the October 17, 2017 meeting. Are there any errors or omissions? All right, motion. Motion to approve. All right, do I have a second? Second. All right, Jim. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? All those opposed, abstaining? We have one abstention. And um, we also have uh, minutes from the November 7, 2017 workshop. Any errors or omissions with this? All right. All the to accept the minutes. Okay. Second. And uh, Jonathan seconds. All right. All those in favor? Opposed, one abstention. All right. I wasn't present, so. All right. The first order of business is 75 Ocean House Road. Um, 75 Ocean House Road, private rate, road, private access way, KTO LLC is requesting review of a proposed private road and private access way to create frontage for a new lot to be located to the rear of 75 Ocean House Road, section 19-7-9, private road, public hearing this evening. So if the um, applicant would like to uh, give an overview of the project, that would be great. You may go ahead ahead. Uh, while Mr. Regal is getting things ready, I just want to make sure people know that in the memo that I wrote, I referenced a water line. It's not a water line, it's an electrical line that needs the easement. And also I wanted to make sure people knew that the road maintenance agreement has been submitted by the applicant, signed, so the only thing left is for it to be recorded. Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Peter Eagle. I'm with Land Design Solu Solutions and have been retained by uh, Kevin O'Donovan, the uh, owner of the property and the applicant, to uh, assist with this uh, project. We, um, just a brief history of the project. We had a sketch plan uh, meeting in uh, August and a planning board meeting uh, for completeness October 17th. We then had a site walk on October 23rd, and that brings us uh, here to uh, tonight. At the last uh, planning board meeting, there were a number of uh, questions and comments, uh, desired uh, plan changes, and I thought that I would run through those. Um, the plan that you see up on the, uh, up on the board has I thought it, so it does not show very clearly. I highlighted the, the various uh, changes. Uh, the first uh, thing that we talked about was we talked about uh, boulders around the uh, no disturb line to uh, demarcate that in kind of a natural, uh, natural way. We now show those on the plan. There are four of them. And I think if you can see that label right there, there's a uh, boulder. Boulder, Boulder, and Boulder. So there are those four uh, four boulders along that line. Uh, we also had talked about um, the very poorly drained soils and the science and methodology behind determining where the uh, that line was. Uh, we had our soil scientist, Mark Hampton. Um, he did go back out to that parcel. And we did um, put together a high intensity, a class A high intensity soil survey, which was submitted with the, uh, the packet. And we completed uh, on the plan, uh, you will see, it's actually on the next, uh, I'll point it out when we get to the next uh, plan slide, but it is now shown on, the, uh, on that plan. We talked about making the whole road Right now, uh, originally we went from a private access way and the uh, gravel and pavement buildup um, required for that to the private road, which was uh, a different buildup. And we have uh, gone the, 
the whole distance with the thing as it uh, built to private road standards. So it's all 18 feet wide. We have the uh, appropriate gravel for a private uh, road and we have uh, the pavement for a private road. So the whole the whole uh, way is a private road, which would allow, allow a uh, lot in the future to be built uh, potentially over on this um, side of the road and connect uh, to that. So there would be no uh, no need for uh, road upgrades should that ever happen in the future. Uh, we also talked about running uh, the force main sewer line down the road and stubbing it out at the end uh, for a possible uh, future connection. So we have uh, done that as well. Uh, we approached the uh, town uh, police chief about the road name of Edgecombe Way. Uh, there was no problem with that, so we have uh, scrapped the Bellows Way thought and have uh, proposed and been accepted uh, as Edgecombe Way. Uh, we are proposing a 12-foot wide easement along this line uh, from our talk with uh, CMP who met with uh, Kevin out there on site and said um, the best uh, way to serve this lot is with a service line which is only a couple feet deep. Uh, down the easement from that utility pole right there. So that's what we're proposing. Uh, in discussion with the public works, there was a question of what to do with that big beech tree and monumenting the corner of the, um, of the lot. Uh, we have added that note on the plan right there that talks about should that tree ever die or need to be removed for whatever reason, uh, a monument will go in um, that location. A uh, comment was made that it would be uh, like to see the surveyor notes and references on this plan and they are now uh, located in that bottom uh, left corner. Uh, we reviewed the staff comments and the peer reviewers comments for this project and we have uh, no issues. There's nothing we can't uh, work out with either of those folks. We don't take any uh, exceptions to those um, items. Uh, we've asked for uh, three waivers. Uh, the first waiver was we have a 35-foot right-of-way um, we, and we would like a waiver to uh, reduce the width from the 50 feet that the ordinance talks about to the 35. The width of our paved uh, private road um, we are asking to be waived, reduced from 22 feet to 18 feet, uh, which we did talk about with the uh, 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 fire department and that they did um, say that they did not have a problem with that. And then we have uh, the third waiver is the distance between uh, uh, intersection separations. And up here we have the Canterbury project and that is um, approximately 116 feet away from our entrance uh, and the ordinance talks about uh, that being 100 should be 125 feet so I, I believe we need a waiver for that also um, one of staff's uh, staff picked up that when we change this all to just a private road uh, that was a be a problem for our road frontage so we are asking that we be approved for a private road and private access way even though we aren't even though I guess maybe we have a private access way but it's all being built to uh, private road standards so that the lot that we're proposing this lot to back here um, uh, would does not it's not required to have uh, frontage and I will uh, move to the next the next uh, plan can I ask a quick question oh. while you're still in this case? So would the private access way be the area, is it a specific area or is it applied to the whole road? Uh, it, it, could, it can only apply to this section because we have, uh, because you can't have three lots utilizing it without it being a private road. So should another lot be built back here, then I believe this next, whatever was built onto here would be a private access way. And we could be, then we could be called either a private access way or a private road. I think it, it 
would make no difference. It's all being built to the same standard. Um, I think we just run into a problem if we call it a private road. Would you like Maureen to jump in and clarify? Yeah, that would be that would be very helpful. No, does anybody else need me to jump in? <laughs> <laughs> well, we we did ask the applicant to take his existing private access way and, and upgrade it to a private road. The board was okay with that. But if you can think of you're granting a private access way permit for the area of proposed road that's adjacent to the lot. And the reason we had to do that is when you get a private access way, you're not trying to create the amount of frontage you need. It's like getting a, getting a, uh, getting a, get a jail free card. You do the private access way instead of providing frontage. When you have a private road, you still need to have the frontage that is required in the ordinance. So this lot is at, I think I added it, it was like 77 feet, and it needs 100 feet on a private road. But is there, I mean, is there a point where it's specifically this is the right, of, no, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I did just uh, switch my uh, slide, and so now you can faintly see um, kind of a brownish line, which is the, uh, the, the new uh, peachum soil that has it closed on both, both ends and labeled uh, peachum. And those are, uh, those are our updates since our last uh, meeting in site walk. Um, those were the waivers that we are hoping uh, we could um, be approved for. You all set? I'm all set. Great. Great. At, uh, at this time, I'd like to open this project for public hearing. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak on this particular item? My name is Jonathan Clark. Uh, my wife Patty and I live at 73 Ocean House Road. Uh, we are the abutting property and the owners of this uh, right of way that's being developed so that uh, Kevin can have his lot in the back there. Um, and I appreciate all the work that Kevin has done to salvage the property at 75. Uh, he's put blood, sweat, and tears into it uh, in a project that many people, by almost universal opinion, would have written it off as a total uh, demolition project. Uh, but I would like the committee to bear in mind that everything that is being built and approved for is being built on the back of our land. Um, We'll still have to pay the taxes on that land, that right of way, that road. And it was never part of our thinking originally that there might be another developable lot uh, in the back of our land. Uh, that may or may not be something we want to approach in the future. But uh, the development of this whole scenario I, I would still have to say that, you know, it's going to be something we'll be seeing out of our back windows, out of our bedroom windows, out of our house windows from now forward, if given to the point whenever it gets created. Um, so I want the committee to be fully aware that this whole development takes a major chunk out of our backyard, something that we've been enjoying peace and privacy in for uh, decades since we bought the property in 1975. The uh, simple agreement that was established perhaps back in the 20s and 30s to have a shared driveway between our place and the Foster's place uh, where we shared plowing and shared driveway maintenance for many years. Uh, if this is now be going to become a private road and I appreciate that uh, Kevin is taking over all the maintenance of it. I think that's a good thing. 
but uh, it's still our land, our property, and uh, we're going to have to live with it and live with all the changes that go about it. Uh, we sent an email requesting you consider the value of the trees that will have to be taken down on that land back, uh, back of the wooded area. Um, there's a lot of large old timber there and a number of them will have to come down. We've made suggestions as to how they should be utilized uh, and hope you'll take that into consideration. Um, and overall, I appreciate all your help and consideration in this project. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this project? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and open this up to the board for questions. Go ahead, Victoria. Um, do you have timing when you think you might be building this? Uh, no. Timing issue? Okay. Um, what was the question again? That I couldn't hear you. A timing when oh, they okay. think they might put this in. Um, then I'm going to throw out something kind of crazy. Uh, the clerks have written a number of emails to us, and I do recall one saying that they would lose some uh, vegetation if this road goes in prior to, I believe, it was mid June. Is this? It, could we put something in there that says you would time this? after June? I, I'm just, it's craziness, but if you don't have anything scheduled, I'm just going to throw it out to you. Uh, well, I, Kevin's trying to sell the front uh, house, yeah. and obviously he's been trying to get this approved so that we can put the power in, in through the easement and then everything would be cleaned up and undisturbed, but I don't know that he was wanting to lock himself into if somebody wanted to buy the front and the back or just you know what's trying to leave open to all those different scenarios okay. um, I guess I was, there's nothing that I can compel you to do yeah. it's not in the ordinance but I'm just throwing that out that um, maybe you can yeah. keep that in mind if, uh, certainly um, another item is um, we did receive, and I'm not sure if you saw the latest email from the clerks in regards to uh, the value of the trees. Did yes, you we did. Did you see that? What are your comments on his two items that he mentioned in the email? Well, I guess the first one is um, not really knowing the timing of construction, if it will be Kevin that's actually the one who develops that lot or, or what happens. Um, the, I guess the less things that we're tied to that we have to try to pass on to somebody else, uh, the, the better. Um, as far as, you know, the wood, um, I, don't, I don't know that that's, you know, would be a, a big issue if we could make, try to make that happen and not, um, and it wasn't too confusing and trying to hand that over to somebody else of how that all works. Uh, like we said, we don't have the construction of that worked out. Don't even know if we would be doing the construction. Um, if if um, the clerks wanted to take those down now or any time and, and give, I mean, we're not, we're not trying to preserve those. Anybody could take those down. Uh, you would keep it in mind then? Yeah, we, 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 yeah, we certainly would. I mean, and I guess I don't, I think those are pine trees. Are those big pines? It's a mix. Mix. <laughs> well, I just, not knowing if, you know, for firewood anyway, if they accept uh, pine just from just pitch. Just but we, we certainly, so well yes, together. we certainly just would be, we continue. certainly would keep that in mind. And the second item, uh, he didn't mention it, but uh, <coughs> something about constructing the road. And I, I forget, does anyone uh, have that memo? I it's the paving of the uh, drive. The driveway, uh, yeah. their park. Well, their parking area right here. I, I can't. I forgot my memo at home, and I don't have yeah. a computer. But that—that's the driveway that we're. I think that is in question. Do you recall the question <coughs> that I asked? Yes. And can you respond to that? Um, well, again, not knowing if we're doing that construction, um, I think if we um, we would be glad to consider that. We did just get the memo uh, today. Um, 
so we haven't really worked that out. Um, we were hoping that we have, have done enough other things to try to make things a little bit palatable for the Clarks. Um, so we, again, we'd be uh, glad to consider that. Um, okay. As you know, there's nothing in the ordinance, yes. but um, I, I understand the impact. I understand the rights, Mr. Clark has, and I'm just trying to yes. see if we can continue these yes. conversations between yes. two neighbors. So. Yeah, we appreciate that. So I appreciate your answer so that Mr. Clark could have his yes. answer, too. Thank so, you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else got any questions, comments? I, just one thing. Um, I wasn't here at the last meeting, so most, and I didn't get a chance to go to the sidewalk, so I'm most likely going to be abstaining from voting on this. But uh, Maureen, legally speaking, uh, this, as Mr. Clark mentioned, this is an easement over his property uh, to this back proposed back lot. Um, that's been looked into, and the, the town has verified that they. Uh, the applicant does have legal standing to uh, do what is suggested. And that's yes, all been our, our attorney, the applicant's attorney, provided documentation to our attorney. Our attorney reviewed it and completely concurred that there are uh, <coughs> complete legal rights to build a right of way in this this 35 foot right of way to access the land behind 75 Ocean House Road. Okay, and I, we did receive an email from the clerks today. I, I did appreciate reading that, and it does sound like. The two parties are working well together, and hopefully, as Victoria said, that continues. Anything else? I have one very nitpicky thing. Okay, go I'd for like it. I'd like to add like a couple more boulders. It seems like those are pretty far apart. No. Um, I'm open. I, I can't visualize what that would be, so well, I'm open to. They're about. Yeah, well, I, I put them on the points so that you kind of go directly from one point to the next. And I think they are approximately that 40, maybe 40 feet, 45 feet. So I think um, the last time that we saw these on a project, they were spaced quite a bit closer together. I can't remember which one it was. Well, we certainly could put another one in the middle here yeah. and another one in the middle here, if that would that would help. Those two seem to be pretty close. We, we yeah, were I'm trying just to thinking if you yeah. put one in the middle of each of those two large spaces. I think yeah. it was Dr. Holt's property recently. Joey's was right down. Okay. Um, I would support that if anyone else. Would any be. any improvement on the barrier to avoid situations? Uh, we don't have any issue with that. We can we can include those. Fine. I have, a, I have a question, and you are okay with the the um, suggestion or the consideration? No one else on the board has brought it up of um, requiring that a setback of ten feet from the edge of the uh, uh, yes of the uh, do not disturb line. Yes. So that note will be added to the plan? Yes. <coughs> All right, anything else? Would someone like to make a motion? Go ahead. She's going to go. Motion for the board to consider. Finding of fact, KTO LLC, Kevin O'Donovan, is requesting the approval of Edgecombe Way, a private road and a private access way permit to provide access to a new lot located at the rear of 75 Ocean House Road, which requires review under section 16-2-3 of the subdivision ordinance. Two, 
Edgecombe Way will not result in undue water pollution. The subdivision is not located in the 100-year flood plain. Soils will support the proposed uses. The slope of the land, proximity to streams, and state and local water resource rules and regulations will not be compromised by the project. Edgecombe Way will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion control plan provided. Four, Edgecombe Way will not cause unreasonable road congestion or unsafe vehicular and pedestrian traffic. It provides for road network connectivity to Ocean House Road and eliminating through traffic because it is a dead end. Edgecombe Road is laid out to conform to existing to topography as much as is feasible. The proposed Lot 2 is provided with vehicular access. Edgecombe Road is designed to meet town standards except that the existing road right-of-way is 35 feet wide. 5. Edgecombe Way will include a force main connection to public sewer. 6. Edgecombe Way will have not have an undue adverse impact on scenic or natural areas, historic sites, significant wildlife habitat, rare natural areas, or public access to the shoreline. 7. Is Edgecombe Way is compatible with applicable provisions of the Comprehensive Plan and Town Ordinances. 8. The applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. 9. Edgecombe Way will not adversely impact surface water quality. 10. Edgecombe Way will not adversely impact the quality or quantity of groundwater. 11. Edgecombe Way is in compliance with the Town Wetland Regulations and the Zoning Ordinance. 12. The design of Edgecombe Way will provide for adequate stormwater management. 13. Lot 2 will be provided with access to utilities. 14. The applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance section 1631. 15. The project complies with the private access way standard section 19-7-9. Um, should we add one more that says the project complies with private roadway standards? Or did I say that? The right. private roadway standards are under the subdivision ordinance, so 1 through 14 was the subdivision ordinance. Okay. Standards. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of KTO LLC Kevin O'Donovan for private road to be named Edgecombe Way and a private access way permit to provide access to a new lot located at the rear of 75 Ocean House Road be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised to address the recommendations in the town engineer's letter dated November 15, 2017. Two, that there be no issuance of a building permit for a building within 10 feet of the do not disturb line on lot two. Three, that a road maintenance agreement be submitted in a form acceptable to the town attorney signed by the applicant and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Four, that an easement be submitted in a form acceptable to the town attorney that conveys rights for lot two on lot one for the turnaround driveway and water line. Five, that a note be added to the plan that there shall be no road construction until a performance guarantee has been provided to the town in accordance with section 16-2-6 of the subdivision ordinance. And six, that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval prior to recording the subdivision plat. And can I add my boulders here? Yeah, I wrote something. Okay. Let's to add the boulders. Yep, you should add the boulders, and it should be five and a half. As <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, five and a half. Yeah. Uh, that the note on the plans be amended to show the placement of six large boulders along the do not disturb boundary. But I just wanted to make a comment on, on condition number four, where it says water line, it should be electrical line. Oh, okay. Oh, you said that. Oh, that was the correction. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I second that. Okay. Victoria seconds. Any further discussion? 
All right, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstaining? One abstention. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is the Balin Morris Resource Protection Permit. Ronald Balin and Patricia Morris are requesting an after the fact resource protect protection permit to alter 1,557 square feet of RP2 wetland for drainage and lawn area located at 26 Hannaford Cove Road, section 9-8-3 resource protection permit. And we will be discussing completeness this evening. Like to, you know, oh, you're not ready, Bob. My fingers aren't working fast enough. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. I'm Bob Metcalf with Mitchell and Associates here representing Ron Balin and Patty Morris. Over there. Uh, we met with the board last time to discuss uh, the uh, application. Uh, the Morris has bought this property uh, from the prior owner who had made some impacts to RP2 wetland when they constructed their home. And uh, what brought us back to the board was the uh, it put the prior owner had put in a perforated under drain uh, that defined the area between their fenced in yard. I'm not sure how well it's reading on here, but basically this section here, there's an existing fence that actually comes out around the side. And there's another section over here. The what looks like kind of a yellow highlighted area, which I think comes out as red. Uh, is the area that was defined by Albert Frick Associates as the impacted area of RP2 wetland. And I'll step back a little bit. Al's office had actually done the RP2 delineation for the prior built, oh, property owner who built the home. Uh, and we retained Al to go back out to try and define where the limits of the RP2 line limits were uh, prior to development of the site as well as showing what the confines of the outer edge of the RP2 wetland that is undisturbed. The area that's highlighted is the 1,557 square feet of actual filled impacted wetland where the perforated under drain is located actually falls within the lawn area and that uh, when Al's office went out and did the delineation and it doesn't really show very well in here I'll, I'll get to it in the next plan is that pipe actually falls within the lawn area, but the lawn area meets the criteria of hydrology and hydric soils to classify it still as a wetland area. And then is the area further to this edge that actually is undisturbed portion of the RP2 wetland before the site actually climbs back up and is a ridge that runs along this section in here. So the actual delineation of the wetland and field work and test pits were done within the confines of the fenced in yard. The area here and the area upstream were taken off the town's GIS uh, RP2 wetland information. So these are the existing conditions in the backyard. Uh, one of the comments in Maureen's uh, letter was that uh, we had not shown where the hot tub was. Our plan is divided into two sheets uh, where we have the top with existing conditions and the bottom sheet has what was being proposed for the replacement of the under drain. The existing conditions plan did identify where the hot tub is, which is on a poured concrete patio, which you can see here, uh, that was constructed over a concrete paver patio that was installed by the prior owner. Uh, a portion of that patio area was subsequently removed when the hot tub was installed. This one here, which is not very clear uh, due to color, I'm not sure why, that's a portion of the underdrain pipe that's exposed. Uh, it varies as it goes through. It's a pipe that I've never experienced in 30 some odd years of practice. It appears, the best way I can describe it is if you think of a dryer hose, in terms of the wire internal framework, that's what the fabric goes around and that pipe is actually filled with debris and in some places the, the fabric is, is torn. So uh, kind of goes along with one of the comments that Mr. Harding made that I'll go through uh, later on. 
So the, the under drain runs roughly along this edge here, which is part of the mowed area. This is all herbaceous and there's some woody wetland vegetation and then some of the larger trees that come in along the back edge of the defined wetland area. So basically what we're looking at is to install a new line where the existing line is and basically restoring it back to the lawn condition that it's in right now. So I know there was some confusion in terms of just how much wetland impact we're looking at. The after the fact is for the permanently filled area that was associated with the construction of the house. The under drain actually falls within what Al has defined as a wetland condition, which has been mowed since the prior owner had the property. So, so on the our site plan, this is showing where the existing hot tub is. This defines the area in terms of what permanent fill was put in as part of the construction of the house. Partly backfilling in around the foundation because the whole site drops back down at the low point in here and then actually rises back up to a ridge line up in here. Um, so this is uh, the beginning where the pipe starts, the fence in here, and then the daylight's out on this end in here. On this end, it was difficult to find it. There's so much vegetation that's grown in there and some sediment build up, so we haven't been able to identify the actual outlet itself, but we know where, where it drops off on this end of the property. So. so what we're proposing, as I said, to do is to take and pretty much follow the same alignment as the existing line and replace that with a four-inch line uh, and create a <coughs> riprap head wall in here up in this area. What was put in was a combination of some cement blocks, uh, some rock, and it looked like an old barbecue grill. The grate that was put in there is, is a grid on that side, as again, the side is all over crown. So we'd be looking at putting a riprap head wall in to where the pipe would come through, and then we'd be doing the same thing on the outlet end uh, to protect both the inlet and the outlet sections. Um, in terms of some of the comments that uh, Mr. Harding had made. Uh, when we made the proposal to replace the four inch line, we were pretty much saying we were just gonna replace it with what was installed previously. Uh, we concur with Mr. Harding that a larger pipe would make more sense, but we were basically looking at it as a replacement for what was in there. Uh, going up to a six or an eight inch line, I think would be very compatible in the same type of installation we were talking about in terms of it, it would be trenched, it would be a pipe wrapped in, uh, embedded in crushed stone, it would be wrapped in uh, filter fabric, and then the top four inch layer over that would be a coarse sand layer that will allow infiltration from above, and basically the lawn area, we revegetate that area after a short period of time. Um, the comments in regard to an area where we've talked about moss, there's a section down in here that is not lawn, but it's actually wetland area that is moss covered. And what we talked about is going in actually, like you would cut sod, is to go in and take the top surface off, set that inside, keep it moist, and then they can come in, install the pipe, and then reset it back the same day. So they're basically restoring it back to the same condition. And I know Steve had asked for a little more detailed information for the contractor so he knew exactly what to do and that wouldn't be a problem. So we would basically be restoring that to the same moss type condition. So, um, uh, and Steve had raised the question regarding DEP and Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, tried to reach Army Corps of Engineers, but they're so short staffed in that office, it's difficult to get a hold of someone. But I did reach Bob Green at DEP and actually he provided me, I sent him the plan as a review. We spoke this morning and he sent me an email of which I can give you a copy of his response. Basically said if there's no more permanent impact and it's just a replacement of what's in there that the DEP would not require a permit. And I can pass this out to you like the records. We'll continue to pursue trying to get hold of Army Corps to get any answer from them. We'll re <laughs> I'm fighting off the tail end of a cold, so my voice may be fading out on me, sorry. That uh, we'll try and get a hold of Army Corps to find out whether or not they would have any issues with this. Uh, but DEP, uh, when I talked with them, they would tended to think that Army Corps wouldn't have an issue with this as long since they didn't have an issue with it. But 
I can't go on their word. I will reach out to Army Corps to, uh, to verify that. I think that covers most of the items in terms of what's existing conditions and what's being proposed to do uh, for the replacement of the pipe. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Go ahead, Joe. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is what would happen if nothing is done? And then I guess my other question is, is this being done to preserve this as a area that can be used, or is it done to ward off uh, structural damage to the house? It, there's concerns with potential structural damage to the house, uh, the porch area, the deck area, there had been some undermining over there, and there was just more of a concern as the water was building up in the backyard at different times during heavier rain events that that was a, a concern they had. There is a, uh, a, I know you would ask about a foundation drain when we had this, the workshop session, and there is a four-inch line that comes off of this end of the corner of the house itself. And that's the only, an under drain, a, a foundation drain. Uh, that's the only place I was able to find any sort of under drain that was coming off around the building itself. So really, this area in here is where it really gets pretty damp. I mean, uh, I've been out there a number of times since June, and uh, even when we were going through that dry spell this summer, it was still pretty soft in those areas. So that it's really more of a concern not wanting to have anything that's going to back up and have any impact on that foundation. And again, the whole site drops down into this backyard. So. And it's basically maintaining what was there. The, unfortunately, the, the pipe that was installed probably wasn't the proper one to be put in, regardless. Uh, they're trying to improve that to, to help with the area. That's, the, that's a twofold request. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, Bob, you referred to the uh, comment by the engineer, uh, the town engineer, that the four inch under drain didn't seem adequate to do the job, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your response. I, would, would you agree that a, a larger I, drain? Yeah, I, we concur with Steve on that, as I indicated, because it was just that looking at a direct replacement of what was in there is why we proposed to replace the four inch under drain, where it was an after the fact impact. Uh, so we wanted to uh, coincide with that. We initially thought that an eight inch line would probably be a better line to put in there anyway. Uh, and where Steve made the comment that he feels as though a larger pipe would be, we would concur with that and feel as though at least an eight-inch line, and then doing the grate uh, on the up end side to prevent any sediment and debris from going into the pipe. Is it safe to say, though, that the, if you used an eight-inch line, that the pardon me, the disruption and the restoration would be virtually the same? Pretty much the same. Uh, the trench might wind up being a couple of inches wider in order to do it, but for the most part, it would be the same limit amount of impact that would occur. And again, it would be temporary in the sense that, you know, we make sure they're limited to just enough. And it's not going to be that deep, so it isn't like they're installing a major water line or anything. They're going down five feet. We're probably only going down. If I go to a larger pipe, we're probably looking at probably about an 18-inch depth excavation in order to get the fabric, the stone base, the pipe bedded in the, and then put the sand filter on top. So. Thank you. So do we have any questions on completeness of the package? No, I think mine's beyond. It's, it's the uh, engineer's notes. At this time, I'll open this up to a public hearing on completeness of the of the submission. Uh, and something I forgot to mention in the first public hearing is uh, you come forward, please state your name and your address, and uh, limit your comments to three minutes. Is there anyone uh, who would like to speak on this project? Don't sit down, Bob. <laughs> I look at, uh, seeing no one, uh, close public public comment period. And uh, all right, now we can get into the nuts and bolts from the board. Can I ask one more question? Question sure. actually on completeness. Yep. Uh, what are we to? And this is for Maureen. What are we to do with the um, conservation commission's recommendation? I think that's our next question for Bob. Okay. They're, they're an advisory group, so you can take their advice or you can leave their advice. So uh, what I would like to hear is Bob's response to their comment 
we when one of the things we discussed was removal or re um, excuse me restoration. Well, I guess I'm going to confess that I've gone through the pack that was mailed to me, and I don't see a copy of anything from the conservation. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll just give you my copy. It's very short. It came as a it, it came as a separate email. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it wasn't in the it wasn't in the original pack. Okay. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I thought you had seen it. No, I had not seen it. No. Carolyn, could you summarize what the conservation okay. email is all about? The Conservation Commission <coughs> reviewed this project, and they, they are seeing no proposal in this package for uh, restoration of some of the filled wetland. And uh, In terms of the permanently filled wetland area, which is this section up in here, it's really attributable to the, the fill that was put in to secure around the back of the, the house or along the foundation. Uh, and as I said in our, during the workshop session, to re remove all that material would create an adverse grade on that side in order to try and restore a wetland condition on that slope. The area where the underdrain is, as I had indicated earlier, Al has delineated, defined that even though it's a lawn area and where the pipe falls, it meets the hydric and hydrology conditions and the vegetation. And, you, know, you can go into an open field that's been farm field for years and mowed or hay or what have you, and it'll still have a wetland condition in it. So the grass vegetation is growing there, it sustains itself within a wetland condition. So that's why he's identified that still as an RP2 wetland area. Uh, it's got the hydric soils and it has the hydrology. The only thing is the vegetation and there would be nothing to retain on that unless we're going to take the entire backyard away from the, the property itself and allow wetland vegetation to take over the entire yard, which... All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for responding. <laughs> At least it wasn't that long. <laughs> no, it was It's pretty short, no. Um, all right, Victoria, or, 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 um, should we? I don't, it, well, it has to do with the town engineer's letter, so is that beyond completeness, or would that fall into completeness? Where would that fall, the engineer's letter? Are you asking for information, or do you want to discuss the substance of his comments? I guess it would be the substance of the comments, so I'm thinking it does go beyond completeness. Yeah. So, shall we? We. Um, Deal with completeness and then have further discussion. I have a motion for completeness. Okay. All right. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Ronald Balin and Patricia Morris for an after the fact resource protection permit for 1,557 square feet of fill and an RP2 wetland for landscaping and an additional 275 square feet of temporary alteration to replace drainage pipe located at 26 Hannaford Road be deemed complete and include granting the following waivers of information. Waiver of topography, or excuse me, topographic contours of one foot and instead providing contour information at two foot intervals. Uh, waiver of a written description and map of wetland vegetation cover and instead providing wetland soils information a waiver of a higher, excuse me, a high intensity soil survey and instead a wetland soils report prepared by a soil scientist licensed in the state of Maine. A waiver of a stormwater runoff plan prepared by a professional engineer. Uh, so be it. Uh, yeah, that's my motion. That's it. <laughs> I have a second. Henry seconds. All right. Any more discussion on completeness? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed, no one? All right. So, now we can go on to the nuts and bolts and whether we want to have a, think about whether we want to have a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. <coughs> no, I think we should have a sidewalk. Okay. So, go ahead, we can schedule okay. a sidewalk after you go through your questions. 
Uh, well, so I'm going back to the town engineer's letter okay. and I'm looking at question um, three. And um, he's saying, we question whether the replacement of the existing underdrain with a new underdrain is even necessary. And he's saying the solution could be simply to uncover it, flush it out, and then, you know, the rip wrap and how to. What are your thoughts on that suggestion? As I stated, the pipe that has been installed, I have never ever seen in my 30 some odd years of practice. It looks like a dryer hose in terms of the wire support structure with the fabric over the top, and that is deteriorating and failing. And to flush that line out, we would probably just wind up destroying the entire piece of pipe, if you want to call it pipe. So, I, if it were a solid pipe wrapped, I would say yes, that would probably be a, a, a possible solution to try. But because of the nature of the pipe, I could not say that I would recommend that. And I think if Steve saw the pipe itself, he would probably concur with me as well. Ahead, if installing a bigger pipe is going to keep the planning board another 20 years from doing this again, I'm all in favor of it. Bigger pipe will work, definitely. Yeah, I don't know about what the others think. 8 inch, 10 inch, 12 inch, doesn't bother me. You're going to dig it up anyway, right? Well, I wouldn't go to a 12 inch. That's an excessive size of pipe, I think. I think it's between a 6 and an 8. Okay. That way it helps to minimize the amount of impact as well as, you know, Peter was saying just how much more disturbance would there be maybe a couple of inches wider in terms of the width of the trench to make it happen. So. Okay. I don't know if anybody else has a thought on that. I don't know if this is the proper time to even talk about it. This is the time. Yeah. yeah. This kind of straddles the issue of completeness, really, and it is what they're proposing to do something that we're going to take on its face, in which case they have the information, but if we're going to decide it's not, then you're almost back into a design phase, which, so I'm, I, I side with Jim on the, on the result. I think the, this is the right time to talk about this. Go ahead, John. Well, one other thing, uh, this is my first experience with an uh, application for an after-the-fact uh, resource protection permit, and it's one of those um, sort of things that I, I feel like the applicant here is almost a victim of the prior owner uh, who did this in almost a fly-by-night operation. Um, so I feel for uh, the applicant, but at the same time, I don't want to set the precedent that owners can go out, do whatever they want, sell the property, and then the next the, the, the next owner um, sort of gets a pass. Um, but that said, it, it's, I would like to see something from the applicant that, that sort of um, solidifies that they weren't made aware of the situation. Um, from my understanding from the workshop, um, they actually... Uh, took it upon themselves once they went to a, uh, a contractor to find out how to get this replaced and it was the contractor that told them to come to the town and they did the right thing by coming to the town to have this done as opposed to the previous owner who just seems like they did whatever they wanted. Um, so I, I'm not sure if, uh, if my sort of legal background is getting too much on this but some sort of affidavit that uh, the owners didn't understand and did not know um, that this was the uh, this did happen um, by the previous owner, um, and that would make it sort of easier for me to, ex to accept an after the fact um, resource protection permit. Um, so it, it's sort of, uh, I don't know if it's within the ordinance that we need to do that, but uh, like I said, this is um, something that I, I feel for the owners of the property uh, who bought into this and mm -hmm. almost are victims of uh, what the, the prior owner had done. Understood. My we'll talk, we'll work that out. Okay. Anything else? Okay. I couldn't hear it. Anything else? No. I'm, I'm with you guys. If you're going to dig it up anyway, do the best job possible so it doesn't have to be done again in another 10 years. Um, so, um, site walk. When? It gets dark early now. It gets light, light. Saturday. <coughs> this Saturday, I'm going. Not this, not this, not this Saturday. <laughs> <coughs> December second. That's a week. From a week from Saturday, December second. Mm. D day. No, it's that's December the seventh. <laughs> that's actually. So, the second. D-Day's in June. <laughs> 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 
Uh, what time? I can't. I can't make it either. So. Oh. Doesn't matter all day. I can't make it on Saturday, except the second either. Sunday. But if I'm the only one, go ahead. Do you want to do it early in the morning on a weekday? I'm looking at you guys. Um, <coughs> sure. My schedule's wide, yeah. opened up considerably. <laughs> I can't do an early morning one unless you want to do it Thursday. <laughs> Everyone should go for a walk before Thanksgiving dinner, right? <laughs> <laughs> could uh, seven thirty in the mor uh, weekday morning? Would that I work do that. for people who work? Except for Victoria, she just said that that wouldn't work for her. Oh, it doesn't work here. No, I I'm sorry. I just I can't make yeah. an early morning. I can do the weekends. Sunday. Sunday, December third. It's fine with me. I can do that. Can you do that? Yep. All right. How early do you want to do it? Early. What? Uh, excuse me. What day did you say? December third. December third. December third. Seven thirty. Seven thirty. Works for me. Church is at nine. One day I can sleep. <laughs> Seven thirty is late. Okay. Seven thirty. Seven thirty. Sunday, December third. Okay. I'm not psyched about that, Henry. You're not psyched about that, right? <laughs> Overruled, there's too many of them. <laughs> Carol, can I just have one conference with my Yep, go right ahead. Do you want to move it? Why so early? Early? That's cool. I got stuff. Victoria, will 8.30 be all right? 8.30 be better. Can everybody else live at 8.30? 8.30? 8.30. 8.30. 8.30? Yep. Might be lighter then, too. Yeah, I, I don't think there's much light. So <laughs> 7.30 works fine for me. How about 8.30? How about 8.30? <laughs> I guess I better find ushers for church. <laughs> uh, sure, I could do 8.30. All right, 8.30, Sunday, December 3rd. You'll convene at 26 Hannaford Cove Road. Yep. Okay. Can I have another motion? Motion table. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Ronald Balin and Patricia Morris for an after-the-fact resource protection permit for 1,557 square feet of fill and an RP2 wetland for landscaping and an additional 275 square, foot, uh, square feet of temporary alteration to replace drainage pipe located at 26 Hanford Cove Road be tabled to the regular December 19, 2017 meeting of the Planning Board, uh, at which time a public hearing will be held. Do you have a second? Do you have seconds? Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? No one? All right. We're good. Thank you, Bob. Well, for the moment. Yeah. Lori, I'm going to need your help here. We've been missing it on the screen. I can't close this one. I'll, I'll read slowly. Uh, next item on the agenda is Holt. Second, Barry subdivision amendment. William Holt is requesting a second amendment to the Barry subdivision lot located at 31 Hanover <coughs> Cove Road to convey 1.09 acres to an abutter. Section 16-2-5 amendments to previously approved sun subdivision. And tonight we'll be discussing completeness and we will have a public hearing. Okay. I'm going to need Maureen's assistance for some okay. reason I can't shut this or close this one before I can open the other one. I didn't read slowly enough. Sorry. Metcalf with Mitchell Associates representing Dr. Holtz on the uh, second amendment uh, to the Barry subdivision. Uh, Dr. Holtz had been here to receive a, an amendment to the Barry subdivision to 
take the parcel on Hannaford Cove Road and include it with his larger parcel on the back where his vineyard is. Uh, since that approval, uh, Mr. Holt is building his house. The abutter, Mr. Egan, has approached him to obtain some additional land on the back side of his parcels in order to increase in it or enhance the buffer between the, his property and uh, Dr. Holt's. And what I've shown on here, this is the area, it's 1.09 acres. It runs the full length of, or width, I should say, of Mr. Egan's property. Uh, the last time we were here, there were issues raised in terms of Mr. Egan's property. Uh, the prior subdivision plan had just basically taken the information that was provided uh, that had shown three parcels, which are rather difficult to see on here, that Mr. Egan owns. There was one lot here, a lot here, and then there was a flag that went up to uh, access a rear lot. Uh, we provided information to the board. Uh, Mr. Egan had consolidated to create one lot. This flag area in here, he basically ran it all the way to the back property and conveyed that to the abutter, Yoko Bacchus, Bacchus uh, and then created this as just one lot. So that what shows now on the town tax maps is this one parcel. Uh, I know in Maureen's letter, and we were going back and forth in terms of the potential of what could happen to Mr. Egan's property, uh, especially with the addition of the 1.09 acres. Uh, we went back and forth. Uh, when we met with the board at the workshop session, we discussed having a note. Uh, we did add note number 15 uh, to the plan, which basically says, future proposed division of tax map U14, lot one, as amended now formally Thomas M. Egan, shall require planning board approval. So that was a note that we had come up with, discussed with Maureen. Uh, Mr. Egan's attorney reviewed that. He was fine with that. Bill had reviewed it as well as Bill's attorney. And that seemed to be a note that we hoped would satisfy at least concerns on the subdivision plan itself that would uh, require any change in the uh, layout of the Egan property would have to come back to the board first. Uh, it does not really change. While it's 1.09 acres, it comes out of the uh, Dr. Holt's existing property. It does not make it a non-conforming lot. It exceeds the amount of lot area required for the lot. Uh, there's no other changes in terms of access or use. It's just a straight out conveyance of the, uh, the property to Mr. Egan. So happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to open it up to public comment regarding completeness of this uh, submission. Would anyone like to speak? Right. Seeing no one, we'll turn it over to the board for any questions from the board regarding the completeness of the project, of the submission. Excuse me. Are there any questions? It's pretty clear cut. All right. Would anyone like to make a motion on completeness? I've got a motion for the board to consider. Thank you. Motion for completeness. Um, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of William Holt, 31 Hannaford Cove Road, for an amendment to a previ previously approved subdivision to alter lot lines in order to convey 1.09 acres of land to a butter Tom Egan. 41 Hannaford Cove Road be deemed complete with the following waivers granted. <coughs> Waiver from submitting evidence of financial capability. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, Joe seconds. Any discussion? All right. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Right. We're unanimous. All right. So now. Motion for approval? No. No? I'm going to open this up to a public hearing. Oh, that. <laughs> By the way. <laughs> public hearing on this. Would anyone like to speak on this project? On anything about this project? All right. Seeing no one, close the public hearing. All right, board, what, does anyone here have any questions regarding this or any comments? Okay. Now go ahead, Jim. 
Knock them out. Okay, William Holt, 31 Hanover Cove Road, as a motion for approval. William Holt, 31 Hanover Cove Road, is requesting an amendment to a previously approved subdivision to alter lot lines in order to convey 1.09 acres of land to a better Tom Egan, 41 Hanover Cove Road, which requires review for compliance with uh, section 16-2-5 amendments to previously approved subdivisions. Two, the planning board has previously found that the subdivision complies with the standards of section 16-3-1. Three, the proposed land conveyance also complies with the standards of section 16-3-1. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of William Holt, 31 Hanover Cove Road, for an amendment to a previously approved subdivision to alter lot lines in order to convey 1.09 acres of land to a butter Tom Egan, 41 Hanover Cove Road, be approved with the following conditions. One, that a full-size subdivision plan suitable for recording be stamped by a land surveyor licensed in the state of Maine and provided to the town. Second. Henry second. All right. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Unanimous. All right. Thank, thank you. you. I will turn the meeting over. Item 5, 19 Wells Road Telecommunications Tower, Global, Sing Global Signal Acquisition 4, LLC, Crown Castle, is requesting site plan review and a resource protection permit to construct a 180-foot tall telecommunications tower to be constructed at 19 Wells Road, R5-30, Section 19-9, Site Completeness, and Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection Permit Completeness. Um, before we begin, I'm going to recognize Maureen to discuss the um, Resource Protection Permit. Yeah, so I just wanted to make sure the board was aware. I, I provided you with some documentation for the meeting tonight. When this applicant originally appeared before the planning board, it was for a rezoning to create the tower overlay district at 19 Wells Road. As part of that rezoning request, they did submit plans that showed wetland mapping. And there was discussions between myself and the code enforcement officer and the planning board and the applicant that the access for the tower would be on an existing farm road that we knew was in an RP1 wetland buffer. And under section 1963, I believe, it does list that you can rebuild an existing road in a wetland buffer as long as you get a permit from the planning board, a resource protection permit. Uh, I failed to counsel the applicant that when they apply for site plan review for their tower, they should have also concurrently provided an application for a resource protection permit. So I contacted them yesterday, and what you have in front of you is a resource protection permit completeness checklist, as well as amended motions that include the resource protection permit in the site plan motions. Um, if there's any questions on that, please let me know. We also posted an amended agenda for tonight's meeting yesterday that included the resource protection permit in the original application for the site plan review. So if there are any questions, um, just let me know. How are we doing over there? Oh, and it started fast forwarding, so I... Okay, so whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and introduce yourself and um, present the project. I don't know I'm lucky enough to go first. Uh, Bill Jordan, 21 Wells Road, Jordan's Farm. Uh, 
I'm a farmer. I don't know much about cell towers and cell phones except they ring when it's inconvenient. Um, we grow vegetables and every year we plant a whole bunch of different vegetables and at the end of the year we've harvested and hopefully have enough to do it again the next year. Uh, we have the property behind the farm that is ledge, rocks, hills, trees. Uh, we harvested the trees a few years ago. Uh, if I'm lucky, I might live long enough to see another harvest, but I don't know. Uh, there aren't many options for that land back there. One option is, uh, you know, we, and we've had the option in the past, is houses. Uh, we don't really want to do that. It's a one-time crop, and then you're done. Uh, when this cell tower thing came along, that is kind of an, a permanent crop, or at least for a lot of, a lot of years, of a steady income and it would help my nephews, my son, and the, my family uh, being able to continue to farm without and still leave the majority of that property wild up there. And that's why we've entertained the, uh, the idea of uh, letting Crown Castle build a cell tower on our property. But what I've got to say Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, for the record, again, my name is Victor Manugian. I'm with McLean Middleton Professional Association, uh, 900 Elm Street, Manchester, New Hampshire, and I appear before you again tonight on behalf of Global Signal Acquisitions for uh, LLC um, tonight for um, site plan review. Um, I just want to take a minute to um, review where we've been, mostly for the residents that are either here or watching um, from home. Um, this process officially started uh, with this board, with, I'm sorry, with the council on January 31st of this year when I submitted the rezoning application um, for a new tower over overlay district. On March 13th, the council referred that request um, to you. Uh, on June 20th, um, you approved uh, five to zero to support the rezoning request for the new tower overlay district. And then on um, July 10th, the town council voted to refer the zoning amendment to the ordinance committee. And uh, July 11th, the ordinance committee voted three to zero to send the tower overlay map amendment back to the council um, for their consideration. And on August 14th, the council um, considered it and adopted the change. Um, we started the site plan review process with your board on um, uh, uh, September 5th with the workshop and um, here we are today seeking um, site plan review for our uh, installation under Article 9 of your um, zoning ordinances. Um, we tried in this application um, not to request uh, any waivers. Uh, at the end of this I am going to verbally request one but I'll start with um, what we've submitted and I'm going to briefly summarize what each one says, uh, all the reports we submitted. Um, I have 10 people here with me on our team today. I'll introduce people as I hand off, and then if anybody has questions uh, of any of our experts, we'll bring them up um, as needed and introduce them at that point. Um, I'll start with the uh, traffic study that was done by, on October 9th of this year by Hudson Design Group. Um, very uh, brief report and it highlights very uh, minimal traffic and the, the report says that at most there will be 10 trips um, a month for a maximum of five carriers that might be on it. Uh, 10 trips is going in and going out, so five times two. Um, and that's just for maintenance, check the equipment, uh, small pickup truck, um, uh, hardly noticeable. And at the beginning, as we've uh, stated, we, we, sh we expect to have three carriers and hopefully uh, two more later at some point. Um, the next uh, report we submitted is the uh, sound study. Um, the um, sound study um, showed that the levels at the property line are expected to be well below the Cape Elizabeth standard of 45 decibels. Um, 
And in, in, in the report, it talks about um, uh, the decibel levels at the property line um, with just the regular equipment being 36 decibels and um, from the closest residence being 28 decibels. And then if you add in uh, three emergency generators, it jumps to 41 decibels at the property line and 32 decibels at the nearest um, residence. Um, the modeling was done on the worst case scenario basis. Um, the modeling was done using shelter, or shelters that are there now. Um, the, the, the carriers that are, that, um, are on there now, um, if they go over, when they go over, they will use uh, equipment cabinets. So it will actually be quieter. Um, there won't be HVAC units to cool off the shelters. Um, and um, most of the industry has gone that way now. And also we are installing on the eight foot fence uh, a sound barrier um, to help diffuse uh, any noise that may come from the equipment. Um, and again, um, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, author of that report is here if the board has any questions. Um, we then submitted a light study, um, very brief, um, three lamps. Um, it's not going to point outside and it, comply, it will comply with the ordinance. In addition, the, the sound barrier that we're going to install on the eight foot fence will also trap any light. Even though they're pointed down, it'll completely trap light from going out. Um, the next report we submitted is the FAA approval um, indicating that this uh, tower and the height uh, will not be a uh, hazard to air navigation and uh, therefore um, it will not have to be uh, lighted. The um, next report we submitted is the RF emissions compliance report um, and um, the report uh, conclusions, excuse me, the report conclusion um, states that this uh, facility with um, five, um, up to five um, carriers will comply with, uh, I'm sorry, um, with our current carriers that are going to be on it will comply with the FCC requirements with a total um, emission for the uh, three carriers and the town equipment, um, namely um, uh, the, the municipal safety equipment, will be 1.206% of the allowable MPE of a maximum of 100%. And, and as you know, that's regulated um, by the FCC and, and um, um, uh, we will be well under that. Um, so I talked about us trying to comply and not ask for any waivers. Um, what we are going to ask for is a waiver of the um, stamped plan signed by a main registered uh, professional land surveyor. Our current drawings are signed by a PE. Um, um, this is a very large parcel. Um, the, due to the size of the parcel, it will be very costly and also very time consuming. Uh, even to try to do it um, in time for future meetings if uh, future meetings um, are required. And as your materials um, submitted um, by uh, Ms. O'Mara state that you do have a, um, a prior survey uh, on file. Um, we're building a tower. It's uh, several hundred feet from the property line. Um, we're not going to need to record the plan at the registry. Um, so we feel that a stamp by a PE is enough for this. And um, as I uh, have checked, you've done that in the past um, for similar um, requests for installations of this type. Um, and uh, a lot of the speakers after me will present a lot of information that um, uh, was alluded to as being missing. Um, the one thing we cannot give you today, and we will have it for the uh, December 19th planning board meeting, uh, other stormwater, ca stormwater calculations. We are working on those and we will have those. Uh, and again, we want to try to comply with your ordinances um, completely. Uh, unfortunately, time-wise, that didn't work. Um, with that, that's my quick summary of the, our submittal. And I want to turn it over now to um, Lucas um, Anthony, a civil engineer from uh, Goral Palmer, to go over the drawings, etc. Thanks, Victor. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, 
members of the board. As Victor said, my name is Lucas Anthony. I'm an engineer with Goral Palmer in South Portland, and I'm here tonight on behalf of the applicant. Um, as Maureen indicated, we're here tonight for a completeness review on both the site plan and resource protection permit. So relative to that, I'm going to spend a little bit of time first briefly walking through the plans that we created, um, and then secondly, uh, summarizing and, and discussing some of the uh, uh, completeness request items that you have in the memo from Maureen. So the uh, applicant has made a submittal on November 2nd for site plan review for a 180-foot wireless communications tower. The site's located at 19 Wells Road on the Jordan Farm property. The plans that you have in front of you were created by EBI Consulting in Burlington, Massachusetts, and I'll, I'll be referring to these through my discussion. So. Those are also in your packets. I'll scroll down. The site is located um, 19 Wells Road, as we noted earlier, which is um, off Spurwink Road and north of Wells Road. The site can be accessed by um, the existing gravel, gravel road, Deer Run, and at the end of Deer Run Road, there is a um, existing eight to 12 foot gravel woods road and that extends north almost to the end of the property. That's the road that will be used to access the, um, the tower site. And again, that's an existing road. It's, it's eight to 10, 12 feet wide, kind of varies. Um, as it runs along the pond, it does get somewhat narrower there um, just to get over the pond spillway. So as part of this project, we'll be improving the gravel road. Um, mainly that will consist of resurfacing, leveling it off, and, and uh, providing a surface that it's, uh, to serve the vehicles that are intended to maintain the site and also to allow emergency vehicles to access the tower site. We will um, be making drainage improvements to the road as part of this application in order to ensure proper drainage and also prevent erosion during the post-construction period. Where the um, tower site will be located is within a 100 by 100 foot lease area. And inside that lease area, there's a 75 by 75 foot gravel pad. On that pad will be located the tower and the ancillary equipment that services the tower. It'll be fenced by an eight foot high fence. And on the exterior of the fence, there, um, there will be some uh, evergreen trees planted for visual buffering. As I mentioned earlier, the gravel road to get to the tower site is existing. However, um, the last stretch from right near the tower of about 250 feet, we do have to construct a new segment of road. That road was sited to really to avoid the resource protection zone and to minimize any impact to that area. Overhead electric will be brought to the site from uh, where Deer Run ends. At the end of that gravel road, it'll be brought up the new road by overhead poles. So that's a quick overview of the plans. And um, next, I'd like to refer you to the memo from Maureen on the summary of completeness for the site plan review. And I'll walk through a couple items there. But Victor briefly mentioned the survey and that we're requesting a waiver. Um, he also mentioned Item I, where the town engineers recommended a stormwater review be performed. Um, we're currently in the process of, of doing those calculations and expect to have them ready for the next board meeting. Item L references um, that no landscaping was proposed. And as part of the original application, that was true. Um, 
However, since that time, the applicant has proposed to install um, an evergreen, we'll call it a hedge, around the exterior of the fence. And we have a revised set of plans that depicts that, and that will also be depicted on the plans that the updated plans this board will receive for the next meeting. Those are the items under the site plan completeness checklist, and um, the, the applicant would like to request that the board consider the application complete. In addition, um, as we move on, there's a completeness summary for the resource protection permit, and I wanted to touch on that just a bit. Item number two, topographic survey. Um, we have provided existing topography for the site, and that's within your plan set. Um, so you can see we provided the existing topography and also some of the proposed topography. Um, as part of the stormwater calculations and revisions we'll make to the plans, the, um, the rest of the proposed topo will be included. Um, item number three, there's a significant written discussion of the parcel but not a specific written description of the entire parcel. Um, what we hope to do is get the um, survey updated and that would include a legal description of the entire parcel. Um, item number five, the applicant has mapped wetlands based on soils rather than vegetation. Um, subsequent to the initial application, TRC has performed a, a full wetland delineation and we're gonna make that uh, information available to the board for the next application or to Maureen shortly uh, after this meeting. And item number nine, the stormwater we touched on um, already that, as an item that we're working on currently and we'll have ready for the next meeting. Uh, similar to, uh, to before, I'd like to ask the board to consider the application complete so that we may move on to the next stage. That's all I have. Paul, thank you right next. A couple pages. Okay, which are the photo sims? A lot of you have seen these before, but for the people that haven't in the audience, uh, this is the photo sims that we performed. This is the way the infrastructure looks today. I'm just going to scroll down. It doesn't seem to. This is how it would look in mid construction. You can see the new infrastructure, the new tower over to the left hand side, the two existing towers on the right hand side. The you know, the beefier self-support tower is the one that's coming down. The guide tower will remain. The slimmer monopole is the new one that's proposed over to the left. Let's see, there we go. Again, this is what it would look like post-construction. New monopole over to the left, existing guide tower on the right. These photos are taken from right there at the intersection of Wells Road and Spurwink uh, at the front, front of Jordan's Farm. Uh, this picture taken from Lighten Farm Road. Again, this is the old infrastructure. It wasn't visible through the trees. Uh, and that's the same with the new infrastructure. Here taken from the golf course. Same scenario, just wasn't visible through the trees. Uh, these photos were taken from the wastewater treatment plant. This is how it looks today with the two towers side by side. And this is how it would look with the new tower over to the left hand side. This is taken from the corner of Sprawling Church. You can see the two towers just right there at the edge of the tree limit, right on the horizon. And then when you move it over to the new structure, it's tucked in behind the trees, Can't, not visible from this angle. This is taken from Sawyer Road just before you're heading over to the marsh. You can see the two towers just above the tree line. I'm gonna give this a shot, see if I can get that. <coughs> Here's the same shot with the new infrastructure, the, the new monopoles identified there in the tree cover. Now this came up during the planning commission meeting about the view from peppergrass and tiger lily. And when we responded, this was the view that we had. So based on the questions that were raised in the planning, planning commission me member, planning, planning board meeting, excuse me, we sent the team back out to do additional photos 
And what we asked them to do is drive the entire length of both peppergrass and tiger lily to see if they could see the, the balloon. This is the shot that they took. Here's where the tower does come in right over the top of this, ta this house here. Moving on, this is taken from tiger lily. You can see the old infrastructure is not visible, but the new infrastructure is just tucked in there behind the trees. Sent them to the site itself. This is at the center of the monopole looking north. Again, at the site looking south. Here's the site looking east. And then finally, the site looking west. That's it for the formal presentation. We're here to have, and happy to answer any questions. Sit down. Could I interrupt for a second? Yes, I don't know if Jonathan's working in the sound booth, but my monitor isn't working. It makes it very difficult for, for me to hear. So who is ever in the sound booth, if they could turn them up. Oh, I, I, it could be me. I didn't have this No, close no, it's not you. OK. It's, it's these things. OK. Happy to answer any Yes. Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm so sorry. It, it's Paul Peckins with Crown Castle. And I'm out of our Richmond, Virginia office. Thank you. Yes, we Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Do any of the members of the board have any questions before we open it up? I just Jonathan. Have, I just have a question for Maureen. Maureen, am I incorrect? Uh, I thought it was if a storm, if an application uh, isn't going to affect more than 10,000 square feet. Um, then a stormwater assessment is not necessary. That is true. If under and remember, we're re reviewing it under two sets of standards. So under site plan, um, your standard is that if you have less than 10,000 square feet of impervious surface, you do not have to do what we call the pre and post calculations. What you are supposed to provide us with a an LID, a low impact development feature. Okay. Um, but under the resource protection permit standards, we have not made those standards mirror site plans. So in that one, it does say you're supposed to have a stormwater report prepared by a professional engineer, which the board can waive. And I'd suggest that you could look to the site plan standards for some instruction as to whether it's appropriate to waive it. Thank you. So we are getting a resource protection app permit application that details how the re, uh, what steps will be taken in the building of the road and the the applicant should be providing that information as part of the site plan anyway and um, the resource protection permit the, in my opinion the most important pieces of information that you should have is a good quality mapping of the wetlands and a decent explanation of what activity is happening in the wetlands and you could make the decision that the plans that you received that were submitted November 3rd had at least that much information in it. Victoria. Um, once again for you Maureen, under completeness um, on item D, no survey has been submitted for the 67 acre parcel. Um, what is your opinion on that as far as completeness goes? Well, the, in the past, the board has been more flexible with very large parcels where um, there's not a lot of activity. And I would refer to the prior tower application that on 14 Strout Road, on that application, you did waive the requirement for a full boundary survey. You required that you had get boundary information for the two north-south boundary lines, but you didn't require the full survey. In this case, um, this particular property has been before the planning board in 2007 when the Jordan family created some um, house lots for the family members, and there was a survey created at that time, and it is, it is on file in the office. Thank you. Thank you. So can I ask the applicant, what are, you've shown um, boundary lines, what's that based on? Are they based on just looking at the existing survey? What sheet are you looking at? Um, C1. 
So um, the boundary lines on that sheet are based on this town's GIS mapping. So they were taken directly from that. Uh -huh. <coughs> so, Maureen, the, the front portion of the property was done by the engineer and the surveyor up to where the tower was because we specifically had to map out how the overlay district was extended into the property, but they didn't carry it all the way back just simply due to the, due to the size of the, the track itself. So which lines are you saying were are located? You're saying... Uh, the 100, the, the 250 foot square is located properly or accurately? Oh, yes, sir. The, the, the front drive in. Is it the heavy black line? Uh, I'll, let me see if I can get back up to the Okay, and Maureen, can you answer? I just want to say that when the board was <coughs> looking at the tower overlay district application, I, I did tell the applicant they needed to provide us with very good quality information on where that square is located. And they did provide me meets and bounds, distances, and that's how it was drawn and was approved. So I, I believe there was better quality information uh, for the tower overlay district. But, but even the district itself, Maureen, I don't believe was so, itself the subject of a, a survey right. and, and, and monumented corners and all the rest of it. It's, yeah, it's, that was never monumented. No. Right. So it's still drawn from reference points, right? Yes. It's, and if I remember correctly, it was taking the corner of the Jordan Farm property where it intersects with Deer Run Road and going, <coughs> I don't know, it was like 471 feet and then going and creating a square. Joe? Uh, Victoria. What type of... Um, um, is that RP1 or RP2 up there? Um, <coughs> let me answer that. From the, the, this was something that was discussed by the planning board when you recommended the tower overlay district in June because it was raised by staff that you can't build new roads in buffer zones. So the portion called RP1 that is to the south of the road that is absolutely uh, an RP1 wetland, and that is the one that has the 250-foot buffer. And the applicant was working <coughs> pretty hard on the wetland to the north, which is identified on here as CE-5, and that's an RP2 wetland. Thank you. Peter. Yeah, the, um, if I understood your presentation correctly, much of the road is simply going to stay what it is with some resurfacing of gravel and the like, but there's a segment up near the tower site where you will actually be, I take it, cutting road or doing more to it than the rest of the road will entail. Could you go into that in a little more detail? Yeah, the, um, if you can see on the screen there, this segment from the existing road to this tower site. And it's kind of hard to see on this plan. Maybe I can, I can get a bigger one um, right here. That's, that's better. So the tower site is, is this box, <coughs> 75 by 75. And this road from, from this edge of the tower site all the way over to the existing road. That's the new stretch we're talking about. And that's about 250 feet long. And that's within the RP1 buffer, or no? That is not within the RP1 okay. buffer. You couldn't do that there, if it, were, if it were? No, we weren't permitted to to put a new road in the RP1 buffer. Is, is that in the RP2? Or is it in wetland at all? I think the but, RP1, uh, the buffer shows pretty clearly on sheet C3 where it ends. You see that 250 foot wetland? Which is, is this line? I'm sure you're going to say C3? C3, yeah. 
and I'm also pointing to that on the, the screen. Tower. splits off the existing road for just that last little bit to get into yep. the town. That's correct. Maureen, that was actually a suggestion when they originally came, they were going to um, create a new road through the, the buffer and we actually had them and they uh, changed their application to actually use the existing gravel road that's been there for years and then make this new one that's not in either an RP1 buffer or RP2 buffer, or RP1 buffer zone or an RP2, correct? Correct. All right, any other questions? Just one, this is all going to be gravel? Yes. No tar, no anything, just the concrete is for uh, <coughs> inside the actual, uh, where the antenna and any sort of generators or machinery that's going to have to be used? Correct. The uh, Inside the, the fence line is a 75 foot by 75 foot gravel area. Um, some of the equipment will sit on concrete, but otherwise it's it's gravel. What do you think the estimated uh, amount of concrete uh, per square feet is going to be? Is it going to be in excess of 10,000? No. What do you think? Less than 1,000. Less than 1,000? Yeah, it's, it's small. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, anyone else? All right, I'm going to now open this up to public comment. I want to just remind everybody that this is um, a hearing on the completeness of the application and not the substantive issues. So if you could keep your comments to that, I think it will speed things along. So who here is going to speak? Okay. Oh yeah, I'm the uh, we have a three-minute limit as our usual. Good evening. My name is Matt Bessie. I'm an attorney at Brandon Isaacson. I've been retained to represent Jeff and Sonia Gorman of Nine uh, Peppergrass Road. The Gormans are and their neighbors in the Cross Hill neighborhood are very interested in this project and are here to to make their voices no heard. Um, the application, as we indicated in written comments that were provided to the planning board, is incomplete in a number of regards. Uh, first of all, with respect to the resource protection permit, uh, our view is that it's improper to amend the agenda to include an application a day in advance when the rules of the planning board require 18 days advance notice. Uh, and similarly, multiple items from that are required submission requirements for the resource protection permit have been either promised at a later date or not provided. Uh, as a result, with that respect to that application, the planning board should vote that this application is incomplete and wait until that information has been received before uh, making a completeness motion and proceeding to a consideration of the merits. With respect to the uh, completeness of the site plan application, uh, we pointed out a, a number of uh, potentially technical in completeness issues, there is uh, inconsistency in the plan and the application regarding the identity of the applicant, whether that is STC6 company as, as marked on the plans or a Global Signal Acquisitions for LLC, which is the, uh, the name of the applicant on the site plan application. That inconsistency ought to be corrected before any uh, completeness finding is made. Uh, in our review of the file, we did not see a uh, ability to serve letter from Central Maine Power. And similarly, uh, that applicant identity inconsistency may come into play with respect to financial capacity. It's unclear from the record and the, uh, the file available to the public whose information was reviewed by the town manager. That's something that, that's not available to us as members of the public to see. Uh, the core issues, however, that, are, that I think are, are missing and that are incomplete in this application 
it is a submission requirement for a tower application such as this to provide information that would demonstrate compliance with the tower performance standards. And certain information is, in the view of the, the Gormans, missing, specifically information regarding coverage before and after. There was no coverage map provided that shows coverage before and after as in the context of the, uh, of the networks of any given carrier. In fact, it is at this point, based on the application, it appears purely speculative which carriers will actually come and locate on the tower. Uh, that plays into the second concern, which is one for co-location, a requirement under the tower performance standards. Uh, this planning board may require a wireless carrier to locate on an existing tower in order to uh, provide for co-location, and information was not provided with respect to that, uh, that issue as well. And then the, finally, we had pointed out environmental impact, and that was recognized. Uh, but we, you heard our comments about the resource protection permit. So okay. thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on up. Is anyone else speaking? If you, yeah, you can just mosey on up there. Good evening. I'm Robert Crispin, owner of Five Peppergrass, along with my wife Kathleen. Currently not represented by council, but I uh, uh, may well uh, find myself in that position at some point. Now, in deference to your comments, Mr. Chair, about comments being regarding the completeness, I, I note that Mr. Jordan's comments to start the, the session had nothing to do with completeness. So I assume that um, what my opportunity would be to speak would be consistent with what was provided Mr. Jordan. May I assume that? Uh, well, not really. He's introducing the project. I don't see the difference. Yeah, he's an owner of the property. Well, I'm an owner of a property yeah, who's affected. If the project is deemed complete, you will, have plenty of, you will have an opportunity to speak at a public hearing and air your opinions on the application. So you're telling me I don't have the right to speak. I just want to make you sure. have the right to speak. Absolutely. But we're asking you to speak on the issues of completeness of the application at this point. All right. And when will I be able to speak on other issues? When you schedule a public hearing. Yes. Which when will be when? Don't know yet. We don't know yet. We haven't, deemed, we haven't gotten as far as deeming the application complete. But any comments tonight are out of line, you're telling me. I just want to make sure they may I not understand the rules. They taken account of. Pardon me? That we may not take account of them because we have not deemed the application complete yet. And are you planning to deem it complete? No, no. I don't know. You have one minute left, Mr. President. Okay, fine. So I ask a question, uh, you know, of the, uh, are you planning to deem it complete? We don't know. We, we, don't, have, we don't have a plan to. We'll okay. Go Sir, we're waiting here from the public. We're going to discuss it, and then we're going to take a vote. Okay. Thank you. I'm Matt Campbell from Tiger Lily Lane, uh, 19 Tiger Lily Lane. Thanks for allowing me a chance to ask a question or talk about the completeness. In the uh, pictures, and I appreciate Crown Castle based out of Virginia, not Maine, um, taking a pictures of, the, of Tiger Lily Lane and all the other areas, is it complete or, or could they do a complete job by do, taking those pictures with the leaves off? Half the year, the leaves are off the trees. It's a simple question. Ask the question again. I mean, could, could you guys, in, in, in asking for completeness, because like Mr. Jordan, I'm, I'm the simple guy and I don't really understand this whole process. It's been thrown at us. The applicant address those questions. So I would love to know, I, I guess, in, in completeness, from a visual perspective, those pictures are great with the leaves on the trees. I'd love to see the pictures with the leaves off the trees. That's my statement. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm John Baldwin, One Peppergrass Road. And uh, I would just like to uh, support Matt 
little bit in the visual impact of the uh, uh, tower, what, how it was presented. When you look at the pictures, actually, the tower shows up in different locations in the individual pictures, and I don't think it's representative of the actual height or impact on the community in the tiger lily peppergrass areas. And I strongly object to the approval of this tower with the uh, uh, 14 Strout Road already in place and the efforts to uh, co-locate co uh, towers into one area. This seems completely redundant. Thank you. Justin Strout, um, representing the Strout Trust Tower Specialist. We're a butters to this property. And um, as far as completeness, I would say that the, the survey concerns me. Um, when you have a road that is going right along the edge of the property line, I'd like to know that it's located, especially when they have to widen it um, and redo a spillway and a bunch of other things. I'd like to know that it's where it's supposed to be. I would also like to note that when we provided our application, we had to do, based on the setbacks, we had to do the property sidelines to make sure that the setbacks were in the right location, the tower was in the right, right, right location. Um, I think that's, that's one of my biggest concerns. And then I, I essentially echo Mr. Bessie said, uh, you know, the CMP, CMP uh, letter, that was something that was the first thing I saw that you had to, to actually provide and they didn't provide. Another thing they didn't provide, which I had to provide and is not in their application, is I, I had to provide a list of abutters and I didn't see that anywhere in the application. So I guess that's what I have for completeness issues. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Fran Tai of 13 Peppergrass Road. Um, echoing uh, Matt Campbell's comments um, about the photos that were taken to show the vis visual impact, um, I didn't see one from closer to my property, and I, I would uh, like to see that. But probably more importantly, I think it, and I'm not an expert in uh, evaluating visual impacts, but I think it's customary to use um, a weather balloon to float it at the height at which the, um, the tower will be um, located. And I think um, the visual impact of this proposed um, tower isn't only important to the people that live in Leighton Farms and Cross Hill and in the neighborhoods along um, Spurwink, but this is, a, this is a part of Cape Elizabeth, um, which is very heavily traveled. Um, a tremendous amount of resources have already been expended to um, protect the open space and natural beauty of this area, including the farm, um, the green belt around Cross Hill. And I think a lot of people in this town would like to see what the visual impact of that tower would be because they travel through this part of town frequently. And they live here because they appreciate the, the natural beauty and open spaces. And I think that opportunity should be given to all the people in the town. The date at which that weather balloon would be floated would be publicized and everyone who lives in this town could weigh in on what the impact of that tower would be, particularly in this part of, uh, of the town. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, hi, my name is Robert Robinson. I'm at 17 Tiger Lily Lane, along with my wife, Stephanie. Uh, concerning the completeness of the application, not being familiar with uh, these matters, uh, I believe that the application should have made uh, reference to the ordinance or that's already uh, uh, in the town to limit the uh, number of towers based on a co-location. I believe there's another tower that's being uh, already, in, uh, that's already been approved that's replacing the existing tower that, that will have sufficient um, ability. And I'm concerned that we're actually building a second tower less than 500 feet. Uh, I don't see that as a, as a necessity. And I'm concerned that it's actually going to be less effective than the replacement tower that's actually already been approved by the council. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Okay, seeing no one, I'm closing the public hearing and opening it to the board. Henry. I guess this is for more reasons. Um, is there an ordinance that says about co-location? How does it apply to this particular thing that we have, that is proposed to have two towers within a few hundred feet of one another? And according to the site, service areas that I see on the map they don't seem to be greatly improved on the new one. In fact, they seem to be almost identical to what the old one would be. So how does the town requirement fit in with that legally? Do we know? Yeah, the first thing is the co-location requirement is in the tower performance standards. And what that requirement says is that any tower you approve must agree to allow other carriers on the tower. So that is the co-location requirement. If you want to talk about limiting the number of towers in town, we control that by the limited number of tower overlay districts that have been created. You can only build a commercial telecommunication tower in a tower overlay district. And the town council decided that a tower overlay district could be created on 19 Wells Road. So the way you limit the number of towers is by not allowing too many tower overlay districts. And finally, um, you know, I've had a lot of calls from people. I understand some people are not happy about this, but I, I feel obligated to point out that the town council has identified improved cell coverage on at least the last three goals setting that they've done for the last three years. And the council has made it clear they are trying to improve cell coverage, not constrain it. And finally, there is absolutely true that right now the town has competing telecommunication tower proposals before it. And it has been the position of this planning board during the tower overlay district review, the ordinance committee during the tower overlay, overlay district review, and the council during the tower overlay district review that the town was going to remain neutral. And this was a competition between two private parties that the applications would be reviewed for compliance with the standards in the ordinance. And there wasn't going to be a preference for one application over the other. And I, I can't speak for the board, it's up to you to make those decisions, but that's been my understanding through this entire process. Yeah. Um, Jim? Well, I guess my simplistic way of looking at it, it's a race, correct? Yes. Whoever gets that tower built first, we assume the other guy is not going to build the other one because it would be a waste of time and money. But, but I'm not sure that's the correct. to be fair, yeah. <laughs> both of them get approval, both of them can be built. That, that is correct. It is, it is possible. Jonathan. So I, I just have a question for the applicant with regards to the um, visual representations that were made to us. Uh, I'm perfectly satisfied with the pictures from Wells Road, from Sawyer Road, from Sperling Avenue, um, from a distance that were done. I think these give a very, and I would, I would urge the public to take a look at uh, what's online with regards to the visual depictions that were shown to us earlier tonight. I think they give a very um, realistic representation of what uh, the proposed new tower is going to look like. And also noting that uh, the larger tower that exists now is going to be gone. That was part of the last application uh, that was made. They were taking down one tower and um, we approved another tower. Uh, but the larger tower that's there now is, is, is coming down. And I think that is currently owned by Crown Castle, correct? All right, so um, that's the basis for a new tower uh, that's being proposed by Crown Castle. They're actually taking their existing tower down off of one property and they're proposing to put it up on another. Um, the other question I had though is when we came in is that my concerns uh, were for the residents of Tiger Lily Lane and Peppergrass Road uh, with regards to what the visual impact was going to be from uh, theirs and originally it was told to us that there wasn't going to be a visual impact and then I, I commend you for going out and doing another test. Uh, but I was hoping you could explain sort of the process on how you come about uh, and make these pictures that you provided to us about um, 
how it's going to look. If you could just explain that a little bit to, uh, for our on our behalf and uh, for the public on how you come about to make these representations on what it's going to look like. Yes, sir. Uh, just again, what was raised earlier, we do float what they call a cloud buster balloon. It's a four foot uh, weather balloon and they run it up to whatever the height of the tower is. They go to the different spots, take the photographs, and then superimpose whatever type of tower that is proposed, whether it's a monopole guide tower, self-support tower, at that height of where the weather balloon is. So if we look very carefully in those photos, we should see the balloon? Uh, the balloon is taken out of that, and the, the image of the tower is superimposed in okay. there. So it just it gives a, a height reference, and, and they do, they can do weather balloons or geodetic measures or you know geographic measures just to make sure that they're kind of capturing those right angles. And so on, on that point, you, you did do this test. It looks like originally in the winter when the leaves are, uh, weren't on the trees, um, but then when we asked you as the planning board to go back and do more testing, that was during the summer. Yes, sir. Okay. The first was done in February. The second was done in July. Do you have any idea what number uh, Peppergrass Row this is? I, I believe it's number five. I believe it's Mr. Crispin's property. Okay. All right. Um, that's helpful. I guess I can look at a map. But, um, all right. Okay, Thank you, sir. Thank can you, you address <laughs> the uh, questions regarding the coverage maps, how they are developed and depicted? I, I'm actually... Okay. I, going to pull Steve up here, our RF engineer. He's, he's the gentleman that has far more experience to cover that. Oh, oh I didn't come back on the, on the visual. Uh, Steve Kennedy, I'm a consultant for Crown Castle on 5512 West Coolidge Street, Goodyear, Arizona. I designed the, designed the search ring based upon I wanted to duplicate as much as possible the existing coverage. So there's three existing carriers right now residing on that existing self-support tower, which being AT&T, T-Mobile, and uh, Verizon. So what I do is when I design a search ring, I try to duplicate it and make as a uh, small amount of change to the coverage level as possible. Try to make it the same as it was before as much as possible. So when I designed the ring, I gave direction to the Crown Castle real estate people to go a certain direction, go a little farther west, try to get up a little bit higher on the hill so to duplicate the coverage as much as possible. So running propagation models uh, within a, a specialized piece of gear uh, software uh, called ATOL, we plot that system out and to show what that antenna is going to do as far as coverage levels within that geographic area. It takes into account terrain, uh, foliage, existing structures, uh, uh, path loss, basically is how much radio waves as they get farther and farther away from the transmitter, lower in power. That's the aspect of how we look at. The other part of it is um, the equipment types. The equipment types are going to probably change going from a ground-based radio amplifier to a tower-based radio amplifier from the old site to the new site. So there should be some slight changes in coverage, as in better coverage or better throughput, because the radio is closer to the antenna instead of being ran up with coax. So those are the application. that's the application of how the coverage is going to be done, how it's created or how it's modeled within the system. So is, is that hardware or are you using just software? Uh, it's software that takes into account existing coverage from other sites, from drive test gear, and that model is then optimized to make it closer to what we see in the real world because it's, it's a theoretical model. It's running it's a, a lot theoretical of theoretical model, yeah. It's a theoretical model that takes real-world data and then tunes that model to what okay. the site's going to do. Thank you. Yes, sir. Does that answer your question? Sorry? Yes. Sorry? Does that answer your question? Yeah, yes, it does. Thank, thank you. Yes, sir. Peter, you wanted to... Uh, yes, I, on the, um, the business of the, the visual impact of these towers, um, as somebody else did point out, we're going from the larger structure into the monopole, which reduces the visual, what you can see anyway. But I hate to go low tech on you, Rather than floating weather balloons, can't you simply take a topographical map and do a cross section running on an axis from Spurwick over to Cross Hill and, and put where, where the site of the tower is going to be, a 180 foot rise, and then 
it just seems to me a much easier way to do it, and you could even build in the, the heights of the trees and everything else. And for my engineers, I'm going to just say, make sure you check me on this. That's where I think that geographic and geodetic measuring comes into play, is that angles and height. So not only are they, they can do balloons, but they can also do that other engineering, like you said, it's the, the low-tech engineering of it. What you presented was, was based on the balloon, is that, am I correct? It was the combination of the two. Of both. So what you've presented in those pictures would actually, could be graphically illustrated from a, looking at the geodetics of the area. I, I, I apologize. I'm not quite sure that I really understand the question. I'll need just uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. There, there was some question as to how uh, true and accurate these photos might or might not be. And I guess what I'm asking you is, would that, would those photos square up exactly if you simply took a topographical map and did a cross section running from, you know, from the site of the, of the tower up to Cross Hill? Wouldn't, wouldn't you get a, a very accurate, based on the, on the contours and 180 foot of tower, a, a very accurate picture from the, what you'd see from the top of the hill? I, I believe so, sir, but I, I'd have to get the engineers that did the draw, that did those tests for us to be able to answer that directly. But this is a, a common practice that we use when we're doing photo simulations. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else, Jonathan? I just have one question for Maureen. Maureen, coverage maps are not a requirement of the ordinance, correct? Well, actually, we did put something in there that said you had, to, we have coverage maps. Okay. It, because originally when the, um, when we approved the uh, Shore Acres water tower to be, that, that was not a requirement at that time, but they provided that to us anyway. They did, and, and then we did a package of technical That's right. Okay. And a member of the planning board asked for that to be added. I think that was me, wasn't it? It was you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So it has been. I didn't know you actually listened to me. So <laughs> that, that's right. But I, I mean, the applicant hasn't said this, but I know they've told me that when they provide coverage maps for, let's say, Verizon, T-Mobile, AT&T, they don't want to be held exactly to those because they're concerned that then you know telephone users are going to use those, and that they're not you. They're not for that purpose. They're for the purpose of giving you a sense of when you move this tower so far over what area generally are you going to be covering? Peter. Uh, Maureen, this may be staring me in the face. Do we have in one of these maps a depiction of the tower overlay district and where this particular parcel sits within it? Yes, I believe, and perhaps somebody could pull that up, but it's the black heavy line. Yeah, if you look at C1. There you go. C1, um, the heavy black box is the tower overlay district. And then um, it shows the entire parcel going from Wells Road up to the, the northerly boundary. Sorry, C1? Yeah. So this, this thick black line? Yeah. Yep. That's the tower overlay district. Oh, okay. And then th this within is the, the, the site That's itself. That's the compound. Yeah. The compound. Okay. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Um, also, there was a question about uh, the abutters not being shown anywhere. And again, on sheet C1 is an entire list of all the abutters and the parcels they own, and it's keyed by number over onto the plan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Victoria. Um, just... Uh, Twice it was mentioned the CMP ability to serve letter. Did we receive that? Is that a requirement? Um, I believe that information about utilities is a requirement of site plan review. And I'm looking at the applicant because I don't remember seeing that. But again, to be fair, um, there have been many times when there have been site plan and subdivision applications where you've been informed that the letter's been requested, but it hasn't come in from CMP yet. So I'll, I'm going to just leave that with you, how you want to handle it. Well, um, I know there are, it's true, there, we've gone through, I've gone through eight years of planning, and yes, not everything is always ready. So what I always tell an applicant is, um, 
this better appear when we're ready to make that final vote, or I certainly would vote no based on an item that um, should be part of the package. Um, items that are missing that makes it impossible to go forward are the type of items that I personally then say this is an incomplete. Um, as far as a letter from CMP, I, I don't find that I, impossible to go on, but I would say yes, we want that letter from the CMP if it's not already in our package. Um, same with um, the resource protection permit. Somebody said it was submitted too late. This is not the final meeting, so I'm glad to know it's on its way or has been submitted with the other items, but um, I can move forward as far as what has been submitted. But I do want to see the CMP letter. Um, so you took care of the list of abutters. Um, as far as the uh, road being surveyed and the setback survey, I, I just want to um, ask if, that's, if, if we've done that in the past, should we do that now? Oh, honestly, I, I am hoping that the applicant will find a way to get a hold of that 2007 survey and update the plans they've submitted appropriately. I'd like to see that too. Okay. Um, <coughs> And uh, this whole thing about we don't really know who you are, you need to properly identify yourself. I'm just going to say, I remember one other time we felt the plat did not match up with the um, applicant's uh, name. Just make sure that everything is matching. Yes. So that there is no question. Because there seems to be a question on who the applicant is. That's all I have, Jonathan. Jonathan? As far as the application, um, what Victoria was just uh, speaking about, about who the applicant is, um, I'm satisfied on who the applicant is. And um, part of the package that was also provided to us was a letter of authorization signed by uh, four members of the Jordan family uh, authorizing uh, Global Simul Acquisitions uh, LLC, and parentheses, Crown, uh, to go about this application. So I'm, I, I know some of the uh, council uh, who's representing some members of the public did bring that up, but I'm personally satisfied on knowing who the application and applicants are. Jim? No, it's not really part of completeness, but I know just for the next submission, the, the width of the road, especially over the dam, the spillway, is going to be an issue with me. It looked like it next down to 12 feet, at least what it said on the plan. And uh, I imagine trying to get a big fire engine across that steep sides in the winter time, icy, might be an issue. So that's something I know I will want to talk about when it's appropriate time. All right, this is Peter. You know, this is sort of a lingering concern of my own on the uh, Steve Harding's letter. There seems to be a dearth of information about some of the construction work on that road. The uh, the siltation fence um, and some of the other uh, grading and, and work to be done. I don't know if the other members of the board are troubled by that or is enough of a start been made so that we can count on them to come up with the full detail when we actually consider our own merits. Yeah. I, I was surprised by how the, the scope of their something. comment on the defect. And that just seems like a good question to pose to the applicant right now. Yes, the um, plans that were submitted are, uh, I guess I should back up a little bit. The majority of the road is staying where it is, um, really. So I think when we actually do come in with revised plans, you won't see much of a difference in the way of contours. Um, but we are putting together a revised erosion and sediment control plan, uh, stormwater calculations, additional details for construction, um, probably a sequence of construction on uh, for erosion control purposes and things like that. So you, um, as we move forward, a more detailed set will be provided to the board. And just on, and on that point, I, I've been on that road numerous times from growing up and mountain biking on that road and skating on the pond. 
Um, so I'm pretty satisfied on what they're representing with regards to uh, maintaining that road and also remembering that just like the Stroud property, this isn't going to be a, uh, this is going to be basically a driveway to access um, a cell tower and that's about it. So. No, I, I agree with John, and I, the only thing that surprised me was the extent of um, Steve Harding's comments on the, the lacking, the lack of information on the, the road, the siltation fence, the, uh, the turnaround, they do show a turnaround here, I think, but I guess he had some questions on the dimensions. It just, it, have you had a chance to respond to Harding's letter? We have not. We just received that letter on the 15th and haven't had a chance to respond. We have reviewed the comments and um, feel sure that we can address them all and we'll plan to do so and also speak with Steve. Yeah, the requirements are fairly simple, I think, but it's something that I think you should be responding to and to his satisfaction. I, I just yes. point out, he does say several of the comments here are beyond the level of completeness. He didn't say which ones. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that's his standard, his standard comment. This, this seemed to be a completion type thing. It was really data on the some of the work that was to be done. I, I think that, for one thing, that would be a good thing for us to look at it on a site walk. So oh, for we sure. understand really what's going on with it. So are there any other comments, questions? All right, would anyone like to make a motion? Excuse me. Um, motion for the board to consider. Motion for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of global acquisitions for LLC for site plan review of the proposed 180 foot tall communications tower uh, to be located at 19 Wells Road be deemed complete. Um, we need to add. Yeah the resource protection permit. Yes. And that would be uh, after Wells Road and a resource protection permit. I would say after site plan review, so where it says the application of global acquisitions for LLC for site plan review oh. and a resource protection okay. permit. Right. Okay. And a resource protection permit of a proposed 180 foot tall Communications tower to be located at 19 Wells Road be deemed complete. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. All right, sidewalk. Wait, well, when, before we get to the sidewalk, and, um, Maureen, could you just briefly address the, uh, the spectrum, uh, I guess the federal law with regard to the spectrum law that uh, talks about the, the municipalities are limited in discussing the safety of these cell phone towers and that's, that's one of the reasons why I didn't bring this up uh, during the completeness discussion. So, I mean, my first exposure to this was in 1999 when the first Federal Telecommunications Act had been passed and the town adopted regulations to accommodate that. And there have been multiple amendments to the Federal Act over time. And each one peels back even further town's authority to review uh, telecommunication tower sites. But in my opinion and the opinion of the town attorney way back in 1999, towns are prohibited from looking at health impacts. That authority has been reserved to the federal government. It's regulated by the FCC. And honestly, um, this application tonight is the first time I have seen any, any company pr even provide us information on health impacts. And they've provided information. They're asserting that they're meeting the FCC standards. But the town has no authority I mean, I mean that's, it's a good way to get any approval or any decision you made thrown out. You're not allowed to look at health impacts at the local level. Thank you. All right. Site plan. Uh, sorry, site, 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 site yeah, plan. Yeah, can we go back to that's that? That's a good idea. Why don't we do the same thing? Just go from... Go from one to the other? Yeah. If I'm up. Should we do this one before? What's that? No, not before. <laughs> After. You're killing my morning here. <laughs> You're going to be a church, right? Yeah. <coughs> um, 
would say 9 30 or 10. 9 30. So Hannaford Cove Road, yeah. Because that's a small site. Yeah, very small. Probably won't take an hour, but. No, it's a little. It'll take a half hour, 45 minutes, and then that gives us 10 minutes to drive over. Yeah. 9 30. 9 30. Is that okay with you? Applicant, is that okay with you? Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, 9.30 Sunday morning. December 3rd. December 3rd. December 3rd. December 3rd. Okay, so <laughs> Joe location, where I is think we park on Deer Run. Um, so the, the public is invited to the site walk. Um, at that time, uh, the public is, does, we do not customarily take questions or comments from the public during the site walks. So it's important if you do have questions or comments that you uh, email them to Maureen and she'll distribute them to us. But you're all welcome to come to the site walk. Would, would you like me to send a little map for everyone that says we're meeting yes. at the intersection of Deer Run and Hockey Pond Road? That, that is the place. That Everyone okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Joe, can you there once? Yeah, we've been there once. Joe, can you say the date again? Yeah, the date is December 3rd, 9.30. It's a Sunday. This will be posted on the town's website under the calendar, too, so anyone can go and look at that. Okay. Motion to table. Oh, thank you. Do we have a motion to table? Victoria. Uh, motion to table. Be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of global acquisitions for LLC for site plan review of a proposed 180-foot tall telecommun telecommunications tower be located at 19 Wells Road be tabled to the regular December 19, 2017 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Uh, Maureen. Can we add in resource protection for Yes, and resource protection permit. I accept that. All in favor? It's unanimous. Who seconded? Uh, Jim, you seconded. Did you I did. Second? Jim. Next item on the agenda, if you're going to stay and chat, please step outside the chamber. Next item is the Ware Private Access Way Permit. Peter Ware is requesting a private access way permit to create frontage and access for a lot located at the rear of 69 Beach Bluff Terrace, section 19-7-9, private access way, and we will be discussing completeness.
All right, uh, good evening, uh, board members. My name is Dustin Roma, civil engineer with DM Roma Consulting Engineers. Um, also have with me tonight uh, Jim Logan here. Could you so speak louder, please? Absolutely. Um, so Dustin Roma, DM Roma Consulting Engineers, uh, representing Peter Ware. I uh, was in the audience here tonight, and uh, Jim Logan is uh, here as well with Longview Partners, the wetland scientist and site evaluator uh, that assisted on the project as well. So um, what we're uh, proposing is a, um, a back lot access way uh, construction to provide frontage uh, for a new residential construction on an existing uh, lot of record. Uh, this property um, has uh, frontage on the paper street of Thompson Road, uh, which is one of the roads uh, vacated uh, by the town. And uh, what we're proposing is to uh, build a 18-foot wide gravel uh, access way within a 30-foot easement uh, from the end of Beach Bluff Terrace to, to provide access and frontage uh, for the back land. Uh, the parcel uh, to, be, uh, to be developed with a new home um, is about a half acre in size, um, currently undeveloped, predominantly forest land. There is a stream that runs along uh, the eastern side of the property um, and some uh, rather large trees that kind of run along the western side, stone wall in the back. Um, and is we are proposing a new uh, utility pole to be installed at the end of the roadway to extend uh, overhead power just along uh, Beach Bluff Terrace. At that point, we'll uh, begin underground power installation uh, back to the home. Uh, we have had um, uh, quite a bit of uh, back and forth uh, discussion with the Portland Water District as far as um, the design of a, uh, of a water main extension and a service. Uh, for this lot. So they have agreed to allow for the extension of the existing water main in Beach Bluff Terrace um, and then the uh, construction of a water service that would uh, serve this new dwelling. So, and it's close enough to the roadway where uh, it seems at this time we're not going to need a meter pit. Uh, so it can just be a regular service uh, off the water main. So the, typically the water district will provide an ability to serve letter once they've completed a, a kind of a full technical review of the entire water service design that's been their, um, their recent uh, protocol for these types of projects lately. Um, we've shown an um, anticipated building um, size and kind of building envelope on the plans. We've showed uh, some proposed grading that um, uh, around the building, uh, just to give you a sense of the the envelope and the, and the limits of disturbance on the site, um, especially where they are in uh, proximity to uh, the wetlands and the streams um, on the property and um, adjacent to the parcel. Uh, we've showed the location uh, just by a note of a proposed leach field location. Uh, Mr. Logan has completed an, an HHE 200 septic system design uh, for the project in the uh, location that we've uh, identified as the, as the leach field area. So that information will be uh, provided to the, the board in our uh, subsequent uh, submission packages. Uh, we understand that the town has been in discussion um, about constructing a um, an extension of Beach Bluff Terrace so that uh, there will be an improved turnaround area for public works equipment. Um, we're certainly supportive of this. If, if the town um, can make this happen, I think it would uh, greatly improve the, the ability for vehicles to turn around at the end of the road. Uh, we would certainly cooperate and um, build the uh, first portion of the roadway, uh, the access driveway into the lot um, to be in conformance with the town's turnaround requirements if, um, if, if, that is the, if that ends up coming to fruition. So we would certainly uh, be happy to cooperate in that. And then um, if that were the case, then we would um, potentially eliminate the, the hammerhead turnaround that we've proposed at the end of the private access way. Uh, Mr. Harding's comments uh, suggest that perhaps the, if, if that were not to come to fruition for some reason, um, that the town standards are for a 40-foot long uh, turnaround at the end. We've shown a 30-foot, but there is uh, additional uh, length there so that we can extend that uh, if needed. So we're, um, we do have the ability to do that. Um, uh, 
I believe what I'm going to do now is I'm just turning over to Mr. Logan just to talk about uh, how we came up with the wetland delineations and the uh, septic system design. Good evening. Thank you, Dustin. I'm Jim Logan with uh, Longview Partners, formerly 25 or 26 years with Albert Frick Associates. Bob Metcalf was here earlier talking about a project on Hannaford Cove Road. Al Frick mapped this, that, and the other. That was my map. Anyway, uh, happy to be here with Peter Weir. I've been working with Peter Weir for many years. Uh, Peter owns the house in the front here um, and has always had an interest in, in uh, the possibility for a house in the rear. Uh, it took quite a bit of time and deliberation at the town level with regard to this vacated road. You folks are probably very familiar with that. Uh, we basically delayed coming to the board until that part of the, or that component of this project was clarified. Uh, now that the road has officially been vacated, the area of that road is intended to be added to the back lot, which was always a lot of record. Mr. Harding's letter pointed out that it was a new lot. It is a new construction, a new house, but it's been a lot of record uh, on a map for a lot of years. Um, Dustin mentioned that I did prepare a septic design for a three-bedroom dwelling. We will submit that for the next meeting, uh, and probably even prior to the uh, site walk that we would hope that would uh, get scheduled. Uh, I wanted to speak to the wetlands, uh, both the wetlands on the property, which are RP2 wetlands, the poorly drained version. I am a certified soil scientist as well as a wetland scientist, so uh, recognizing that the RP1 wetland uh, setback would be established on the Robinson Woods uh, property, which is adjacent to this lot, I uh, sought input from the state soil scientist David Roke and had him come down and look at this line of very poorly drained versus poorly drained soils that was on the Robinson Trust uh, so that we established uh, very carefully the beginning point of measurement for that 250 foot critical wetland RP1 measurement. Uh, Mr. Roke was uh, working with me through that time frame once uh, the flagging was uh, fixed in the field uh, at a comfortable location with his review, uh, we had uh, Netto Land Survey go back and actually pick the flags up and locate everything accurately by land survey. That is how the 250 foot offset is represented on this map. It is also how the RP2 wetlands uh, which are adjacent to a small stream that uh, exits a culvert underneath Beach Bluff Terrace, uh, how they were located as well. This project has no wetland impacts necessary or nor proposed. Uh, and then the only other uh, detail was that the Due to the presence of the stream, and I did way back when I worked with Peter on the property in the front, uh, I did have a DEP staffer come out and review the, the drainage feature to make sure that it, it did in fact meet standards for Natural Resource Protection Act inclusion, and it did. And as such, the activity for the disturbance of the area for lawn apron around the proposed dwelling, we will need to obtain a DEP Natural Resources Protection Act permit by rule, which you folks may be familiar with, is the abbreviated 14-day turnaround uh, time. It's a notification that we'll send. That too will be submitted uh, and we'll make that submission and make a copy available to the board sometime between now and either the site walk or the very next planning board meeting, one or the other. Okay? And that's about all I have. So I will add just one um, thing. The um, Maureen had indicated in the memo that it might be uh, wise to expand on the buffer area and, and right in this corner here. Uh, for the wetland impact. We do have the 40-foot uh, the setback that we're um, proposing here to the stream, um, as Jim had indicated, was, is a, um, uh, would be approved through the DEP potentially under their NRPA rules, so that would be something we would accomplish and then and bring to you with, that, with those approvals. Um, 
we would be uh, okay with um, providing some additional width on this corner right here um, to give a little bit of extra buffer to that uh, wetland area where we're not showing it now. Um, I think we can kind of, um, we, we do need to um, have separation requirements from the leach bed to the building and, 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 and all that, so we'll, but we'll work on adjusting that site plan to provide some additional buffer there to the extent that uh, we think we can. So um, with that, I'd uh, happy to turn it back over to the board and answer your questions. All right, thank you. Okay. So go ahead, Jeff. Um, so yeah, I had a question about that. So the 40-foot stream setback, that's something you, have, you haven't got yet. You right. Haven't, it hasn't been approved. Yeah, that's, that's what we uh, felt was a reasonable in the circumstance and what we're uh, applying for through the DEP, which is not yet. So can you like really briefly explain the criteria that they use to grant that? If I, if I may, the, the permit by rule form that we will send the DEP to make notification to them of this need uh, technically would allow us to get as close as 25 feet to the stream. Okay. Uh, we're not asking for that. We recognize that we... But you're reducing it from 70. 75 to 40, uh, which is more than still, or, or not, not quite half, or, or we're not asking for even a 50% reduction. Uh, the process by which you undergo a permit by rule, it's a one-page form. Uh, you do need to justify to the DEP why we're doing it. Uh, part of that justification is that this is a lot of record that has had a tax bill associated with it for years and so forth. This is not a newly proposed or created lot, though we do need to be before you to get access to it. Uh, DEP, commonly with a construction like this, will uh, allow, and I've had various different iterations with the plant uh, the uh, the DEP but it's it's generally 20 to 25 feet of apron lawn apron that they would allow for around a dwelling and in in terms of a, a reduction like this to a stream um, or a wetland of special significance if that's what it was uh, again we need to justify why we're doing it we, we you, you just can't say you want more lawn we look for some 15 to 20 feet of lawn apron around the dwelling uh, for stability, for the ability to put machinery around it, and so forth, and and uh, and ask, ask no more than that. DEP has 14 days from the date of submission to respond to the request, and either we get no uh, response whatsoever, and that is our approval. If 14 days go by with no response from DEP, that in effect is the approval. It's the only, it's an unusual situation. It's the only time you, you don't officially get a response back from DEP on a letterhead. You get the form, code office will get the permit by rule form with an initial at the bottom. And that's their sign off, okay? Okay. Go ahead, Jonathan. So, so we appreciate you guys actually asking permission to do something like that because uh, from what you might have heard earlier, there was an applicant uh, who had moved into a place with somebody who just did whatever they want and went over RP2. So we appreciate you guys doing that. Yeah. Um, my question is, looking at the plans, it looks as if there's this sort of, at the end of Beach Bluff Terrace, um, it's sort of the, the proposed 30 foot right of way goes beyond the end of that road. Uh, according to the map, I don't, I don't know if you're seeing what I'm seeing. Um, and oh, and that little yeah, like beef the little there's back snap where it's cut, colored in red. That and also at the end here it looks like it, so Beach Bluff Terrace goes all the way to the property line, Correct. and you guys won't have a problem with it. It's not a satellite map, so I can actually see what's there besides what's on this paper. But there is a road; the road extends. Correct. All yeah. the, okay, yeah. but um, and then that's that is actually considered Beach Bluff Terrace. It's not considered part of the other parcel um, that goes sort of around that whole property. It's. Yeah, I think. I mean, we had we had the land surveyed by NATO land surveys initially. Um, the, the, the tax maps showed something a little bit differently. 
but that's why we get it surveyed and, and get that information. So that was um, what they discovered through their um, surveying efforts at the road extended to the, the end of the park. Yeah, so looking at the property map um, that Joe was just referring, it, 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 it looks like the property that's uh, parcel number two on, uh, we, we don't have map U, U9, uh, this is map U10. Um, but it does look like the, the owner of that parcel on uh, it's delineated number two and U09 uh, owns that area where you're proposing your uh, your uh, easement. So just as long as you're aware of that and make sure that that's all well and good as sure. opposed to somebody who owns that property, I think that's Robinson property, um, comes and says, hey, you guys are on our property. So, yep. all right. Thank you. Go ahead, Jim. Um, so the Thompson Road gets split in two, right? And half of the top half goes to parcel B and the bottom half goes to parcel A. Right, so that's what happened through the vacation. And I think as... Um, so the survey, up, would you update this to reflect that? Right, okay. and we would be conveying um, the 50% portion that's currently with parcel A would just get conveyed to parcel A. So that's a. what that number 4392 reflects? Yes. Any other questions? Thanks for asking that, Joe, because I was going to ask about that. <laughs> One question? Go ahead. Um, you, might, you may have already covered that, but I just want to make sure. It says no wetland report was provided as support for the wetland boundaries. And okay. and that, that is yeah. the case prior to today. We, I do have a report that I solicited from the state soil scientist, and it does refer to methodology. Uh, and that will, I think, suffice. Uh, that will be submitted in between now and the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. And the same with the um, subsurface wastewater system. Yes, that is the septic system design. I have a copy of it here, but I did not bring sufficient copies. I didn't think necessarily no. it would be appropriate to drop it on the table tonight, but yep. it has been prepared, it is signed, and it is ready to go. Thank you. Okay. Anything over on the side? You guys good? Should I open it up to the public? You guys good? This time I'd like to open this up for public comment on completeness of this package. Is there anyone here who would like to speak to the completeness of this? Seeing no one, I'm closing the public comment period. All right. So are we... Are we good to go? Are we ready to make a decision on completeness of this? I have a motion. Go right ahead. All right. Uh, motion for completeness be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Peter Weir for a private access way to create access to a lot located at the rear of 69 Beach Bluff Terrace be deemed complete. I'll second that. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. All right. Next next order of business would be a site walk. What else is it? What's what are people doing on December third? No. <laughs> <laughs> From uh, let's see, no, there you go, eleven to, to I don't know. I'm teasing, but whatever. Well, we, we can continue to bond that day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we'll be talking to each other by. <laughs> <laughs> Bring a sleep I'm assuming, I, I guess my, I'm making the assumption that people want a site walk, so I'm making that assumption here. So I, I mean, <laughs> some of the questions that have been asked, I mean, Jonathan's questions about looking at the tax map and the little jog in the tax map related to how it's actually laid out would indicate that there's a question. But, well, I, my only question was for them just to make sure that they cross their T's and dot their I's, otherwise it's going to be basic litigation, so it was more just to probably <laughs> be aware of that. So. so one reason to do a sidewalk, I noticed like this next property it has the same owner front and back, and I would imagine that goes on down towards... There's probably half a dozen property mm -hmm. owners where that So is. it means that this could 
key path. Oh yes. Right. So it might be good for us to get a sense of what that potential is like. Didn't we look at this ten years ago? No. Uh, well, if we did, I didn't look at it with you. <laughs> yeah, but it, it went across the yard at that time or something like that. I remember looking at Thompson Road when we vacated it. Yeah. And I remember specifically this property it, at the end of the road. I believe you walked in on the other side. You walked from the front of Thompson Road where it connects with Shore Road. Yeah, I don't we think vacated. you ever made it down this far. Sorry. <clears throat> we, we only vacated half of Thompson Road, the back half, right? The front half. It's still the right. front half was preserved, <coughs> right. and the, okay. yeah, it was extended. Yeah. This has wetlands associated, yes. kind of in the margin. I think we ought yes. to have a sidewalk. So, okay. So when? 10.30. You think that's enough time? we can make it by 10.30. I mean, that'd be enough time. No, no so we're going to walk up that road. You, you get a long walk from where you're parking. <laughs> I'm okay with the weekday. First thing in the morning or end of the day? I'm, I'm looking at you guys. I'm, I'm How okay long with the weekday? This could be quick, I think. I don't think it'll take this. This one could be quick. You want to do it next week during first thing in the morning? I, I could do that. I just can't do the 27th or 28th. Can you do it on the 29th? I can't do it Tuesday or Thursday. I can do the 29th. 29th is a Wednesday. And I can't do a Wednesday. <laughs> well, I, I, do I have to be done by 9 o'clock. I have to be. Have we'll to. be done by 9. I, I have to be done by 8.30. Okay. Eight, so. All right. You want to do it 7.30 on the 29th? Yes. Sure. I can do that. Yep. Is that okay for the afternoon? Wednesday, the Wednesday, November 29th at 7.30 a.m. And we can just, one thing we're going to want to be careful with at that time is school buses and kids on the street. I don't know how busy a street Beach Grove Terrace is, but I know there are kids who live on the street, so just be careful. And I'm assuming we'll park at the end. All right. I'm sorry, what time was it? 7.30. Um, I will send an email out to all of you <laughs> listing, listing, listing these, the and it'll also go on the town's calendar. I'm shocked you didn't want to do it on Sunday, the 3rd. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just spend the day together. So, all right. Jim's getting donuts. Jim's getting donuts. All right. Um, do I, do I get to have another motion? Uh, make it. Go right ahead. Motion to table. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Peter Weir for private access way to create access to a lot located at the rear of 69 Beach Bluff Terrace be tabled to the regular December 19th, 2000 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing will be held. So I have a second. Thank you, Victoria. All right. All those in favor? All right. It's unanimous. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Next item on the agenda is Sprague Solar Farm Resource Protection Permit. The Sprague Corporation is requesting a resource protection permit to alter 400 square feet of RP2 wetland to install underground electrical utilities for a solar farm to be installed at 95 Bowery Beach Road. Uh, section 19-8-3, Resource Protection Permit Completeness and Public Hearing will be held tonight. We'll start with completeness. Go right ahead, sir. Good evening. Uh, my name is Seth Sprague. I'm president of the Sprague Corporation, the landowner and the applicant. Um, and I have with me tonight Dale Brewer, uh, 
statewide surveys who provided our uh, wetland mapping and the wetland report and John Green uh, uh, spread Corp property manager and uh, the uh, the project which we're uh, applying the uh, the permit uh, applies to is a community <coughs> solar farm uh, off uh, Fowler Road uh, near Greenspark Farm, and uh, um, it consists of eight poles, 11 feet high each, on which sit solar panels, and the plan is to trench from these solar panels uh, underground to a new utility pole uh, that we're installing and that will then connect to the grid across Fowler Road. And we need the RP uh, a resource protection permit because there are uh, two sections of wetlands that we need to uh, uh, tunnel through. Uh, as far as completeness of our application goes, uh, we are requesting uh, one waiver uh, uh, for the stormwater runoff plan provided by a professional engineer. Uh, the area of the disturbance that we're talking about is 400 square feet, and uh, which is so small as to make a uh, stormwater runoff plan be really impractical. Um, we also have a partial uh, uh, submission under the heading of the abutters list. We've provided uh, the names, locations uh, of 20 abutters along Fowler Road. Uh, this site is about uh, half an acre within a 340 acre site that encompasses the entire uh, uh, surroundings of Great Pond. And so there are another uh, 46, approximately, abutters beyond the 20 that we provided you with. But they're <coughs> quite some distance away, and they didn't seem to be quite relevant to the, the, the topic uh, at hand here. Um, uh, so there are two uh, items uh, on completeness. Um, if I could just go right ahead and finish the other comments I had about the actual um, right ahead. Uh, permit request. Um, what we're looking at uh, for disturbance is really very uh, minor. We're talking about um, being able to uh, create a trench eight inches wide and 24 inches deep across uh, 52 linear feet of RP2 uh, wetland. Uh, and beyond that, we've allowed extra space uh, for the trenching equipment. Um, and so crossing number one uh, that's near Fowler Road is um, uh, 22 foot long and eight foot wide. Crossing number two uh, down here uh, between this upland, these two uplands here, uh, is 30 feet long and four feet wide. And for good measure, we've added another two foot of uh, width on those areas to create a total of 400 square feet. Um, so the entire, the entire site here where the poles are is, is an agricultural field that we've been um, uh, plowing digging up otherwise disturbing for uh, a long time. And before uh, we owned this property, the Jordans were doing the same thing to this field. But, uh, and we, can, we plan to continue to uh, be able to uh, use this field for agricultural purposes. That's one of the reasons why we're doing the elevated poles rather than the ground mounted poles so that we can, we can still use the field. Um, but since what we're trying to do here is create an electrical uh, service underground, uh, we're required to get the permit for, for, for that purpose. Um, and um, once the uh, conduit is in the ground, we intend to refill the trench, replant the, the soil that's disturbed, 
and uh, when the project is finished, there won't be any evidence that we ever uh, disturbed the wetland. Nothing is being built or being left in, in, in the wetland uh, on the surface. Um, and, and finally, uh, the reason that we're going to the trouble of getting this permit is that we think that this trenching underground, even though we're going to be disturbing temporarily the surface of the wetland, uh, is really the best uh, uh, way for us to complete this project because if we are not able to get the permit, uh, our plan B is to have the, uh, the electrical service come out of the ground on uh, at the boundaries of the wetland and erect uh, poles on which we're, we would have to suspend the electrical service over the wetland in these two different places. And in the future, uh, we think that the, the, any maintenance issues that might arise with those overhead cables would pose uh, uh, a, a potential damage through the uh, work that would have to go on in the RP2 zone. So we think that this is the best way of protecting the RP2 in the, over the long run. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, at, this, at this point, I will open, open the floor for public comment uh, regarding the completeness of this application. Um, would anyone, does anyone wish to speak? Seeing no one, I will close the public comment period and uh, move it back to the board for action or comment. Okay, action. Got a motion for the board to consider? Yes. Motion for completeness be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Spread Corporation for a resource protection permit to disturb up to 400 square feet of RP2 wetland to install underground electrical service for a solar farm to be located at 334 Fowler Road be deemed complete. Second. Joe seconds. Any, any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. All right, step one. Our next step is um, public hearing on this project regarding these, the um, substance of the project. Is there anyone who wishes to speak? Right. Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing and we can move on to the board's questions, substantive questions regarding this project. Are there any? I, I don't have actually a question. I just have a. Um, we the board did receive a email um, from I believe in a butter. I forget the name of the farm uh, that was right next door, but they were in uh, favor of this project, and we did spend an extensive amount of time at the workshop going over the details um, about what was proposed, uh, and we got a very uh, adequate education about what these solar panels are going to do, how much, uh, how efficient they are. Um, so I'm completely satisfied with uh, on the presentation and the application uh, that's been given to us. Yeah, I believe the budding farm is one of the participants in your community power group, is it not? Yes. Greens Park? Yes. Yep. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you've all seen it. It's all installed. It looks good. You know, from an engineering, you know, a nerd engineer, it looks good. <laughs> all right. Anything else? Someone feel like reading? I feel like reading. Go right ahead, John. Uh, motion for approval. Findings of fact. The Spray Corporation is requesting a resource protection permit to disturb up to 400 square feet of RP2 wetland to install underground electrical service for a solar farm to be located at 334 Fowler Road, which requires review under Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection and Regulations. The proposed, uh, number two, the proposed underground electrical insula installation uh, will not uh, material obstruct the flow of the surface or subsurface waters across or from the alteration area. Uh, three, the proposed underground electrical installation will not impound soft surface waters or reduce 
uh, the absorptive capacity of the alteration area so as to cause or increase the flooding of adjacent properties uh, for the proposed underground electrical installation will not increase the flow of surface waters across or the discharge of surface waters from the alteration area so as to threaten injury to the alteration area or to upstream and or downstream lands by flooding, draining, erosion, sedimentation, or otherwise. Five, the proposed underground electrical installation will not result in significant damage to spawning grounds or habitats for aquatic life, birds, or other wildlife. Six, the proposed underground electrical installation will not pose problems related to the support of structures. Uh, seven, the proposed underground electrical installation will not be detrimental to aquifer recharge or the quantity or quality of groundwater. Eight, the proposed underground electrical installation will not disturb coastal dunes or uh, continuous uh, back of dune areas. Uh, number nine, the proposed underground um, electrical installation will not, uh, excuse me, will maintain or improve ecological and aesthetic values. Uh, number 10, the underground electrical installation is located in the wetland and no construction of structures upland of the wetland is proposed, so no buffer is needed. 11, the area disturbed during underground electrical installation will not be mulched with hay and then uh, excuse me, will be mulched with hay and then planted with an orchard grass and clover mix in the spring. Number 12, the underground electrical installation uh, will be accomplished without discharging wastewater from buildings or from other construction to wastewater treatment facilities in violation of section 15-1-4 of the sewage ordinance and 13, the uh, underground electrical installation is not located in a floodplain. And finally, number 14, the application substantially complies with section 19-8-3 of the resource protection regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Sprague Corporation for resource protection permit to disturb up to 400 square feet of RP2 wetland to install underground electrical service for a solar farm to be located at 334 Fowler Road be approved. Okay, been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Good thing you came early, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, get, you get to watch all the fun. Motion to adjourn. I'll second that. Oh, yeah, another motion. Okay, moved and seconded that we adjourn. Yes. Anyone opposed? All those in favor? <laughs>